So whether you're one of our regular friends or you're joining us for the first time today, we're so glad that you could make it. Not only is this the first ever virtual Scottish Members Day, it's our first national gathering and get together of a brand new decade. Normally, we'd be holding this event at Battleby House in lovely Perthshire, and it's a real shame that we can't do that this year. However, I'm personally really excited about the new ways that we've learned to communicate with each other during lockdown. We have nearly 200 people joining us today. Some of these will be people who can't normally make it to Battleby for various reasons, and some people might even be tuning in today from other parts of the UK. If you're a Twitter user, don't forget to follow us and you can use this hashtag on my welcome slide here to tweet about the talks today. So it goes without saying that this year has been rather unusual and the disruption looks set to continue for a little while yet. Most of us have faced a difficult few months in lockdown, unable to undertake our usual volunteering activities or enjoy our favourite butterfly and moth sites. Many organisations across the country have taken a hard hit from COVID. And as I'm sure you're aware from the communications that you'll have been receiving from head office, butterfly conservation has been no exception. Senior leadership and trustees have had to make some incredibly difficult decisions for the long-term preservation of the charity. In short, this has meant that we've had to dramatically reduce our outgoing costs through a, a voluntary redundancy and staff restructuring program. As a charity who works largely with volunteers and the public, we've had to completely change the way that we work this year and many of our usual activities simply could not go ahead. As I'm sure you can imagine, this has also had an impact on our externally funded projects as well. Losing valued staff members has been really tough for everybody. Ensuring that butterflies, moths and habitats that they require are conserved for many years to come has always been our top priority. Our focus now is to move forward with new enthusiasm and aspirations for the future while supporting staff members in their new roles. Despite the difficult year that we've had, there are positives. During lockdown, it's become evident that people were spending more time in their gardens and were forced to slow down and really take notice of nature. We're hearing terms like um, green recovery, sustainability and the biodiversity crisis feature more heavily in mainstream media. We've seen healthy growth ourselves in our online audience as more people become interested in gardening for wildlife. And we have just celebrated the most successful big butterfly count in its 11 year history. As a charity, we have reacted very quickly to such unpredictable events and proved that we are resilient and we can adapt to change. This is so important in this changing climate and we should be really proud of that. I am particularly proud of the way that the Scottish branches came together and offered their support from the very beginning. Together we have supported our Scottish staff members and continued to engage the public through our social media channels when we couldn't get out to see them in person. I'd also like to say a huge well done to our Scottish um, staff who've continued working really hard behind the scenes and it's thanks to them that we still have so much to celebrate in these unusual times. The first success I want to highlight is our amazing Munching Caterpillars programme, which was managed by wonderful team member Polly Philpott. Over the past two years, Polly has engaged with over 3,000 people across 84 schools. She has taught them about the butterfly life cycle, developed teacher resources, and assisted them in creating 19 butterfly friendly gardens in their school grounds. A further 12 schools have also been provided with the tools and advice they need to create butterfly gardens on their own. So the impact has been huge. Teachers have been provided with the resources and confidence that they need to continue this project on their own. The project ended with um, a caterpillar art competition 
uh, which had the difficult job of judging and the winners received some great gifts for both themselves and their school. And I had to include this photo of one of the winning entries. Um, I was having a really stressful day when I was asked to judge this uh, competition. I was really busy at work. And when I saw this very smiley, uh, smug looking caterpillar, I, it cheered me right up and it was a definite winner. So munching caterpillars has sadly come to an end um, and Polly will be leaving us soon once she's written up her work. And I'd like to thank her for all of her hard work and the excellent blueprint and materials that she will be leaving behind. We should also be pleased that even during these really tough times, we have secured funding for a very ambitious conservation project called Species on the Edge. This collaborative project will be similar to Back from the Brink, uh, which happened in England, and it will involve seven different charities working together to conserve 40 of our rarest species. For our part, this will involve David Hill focusing on Northern Brown Argus, Small Blue, Marsh Fertillery, and some of our rare burnet moths. And you can see from this map in the top right corner that the areas we're focusing on are coastal habitats. Uh, this definitely isn't just a run-of-the-mill conservation project and is a huge achievement for the Scottish team. I'm sure we'll be hearing much more about it shortly. As BC begins to recover from COVID, you're going to see a lot more focus on volunteers and strengthening relationships with branches. Volunteers really are the lifeblood of BC and Anthony McCluskey's work is really going to focus on this going forward. There will be a push not only to recruit new volunteers but to dedicate efforts to training and developing our existing volunteers. Even during lockdown, Anthony has still been running virtual training events which have had up to 70 people sign up per session which is fantastic and a lot more people than we normally get at our events. Uh, Patrick Cook is also going to be teaching branch members how to use GIS software to assist their recording efforts. Anthony told me the other day that he had his first post-lockdown volunteer work party and it was fantastic to be back outside doing hands-on conservation work again with our members. As time goes on, we'll hopefully see more of our work parties and events up and running again. So you can expect more communications from head office and the Scottish office about upcoming opportunities and in fact Anthony is going to be speaking later on about some um, winter volunteering opportunities. I mentioned earlier that BC had to undergo a voluntary redundancy programme and sadly we have felt the effects of this here in Scotland as well. Paul Kirkland has stepped down after 26 years of working for butterfly conservation. As head of Scotland, Paul established the Scottish office in 1996 and his dedication and expertise have been instrumental in developing strong relationships with the likes of SNH. He's also been at the forefront of developing projects like the Bog Squad, Munching Caterpillars and our Urban Butterfly Project. In his free time, Paul supports the work of Butterfly Conservation Europe as well and has particularly contributed to recording efforts out in Romania. So we're really sorry, Paul, that we can't say thank you and farewell to you in person today, but we wish you all the very best for the future. If we were at the Battleby Conference Centre today, I'd have to uh, remind you where the fire exits are and not to bring your coffee into the auditorium. But hopefully you've got the first of those sorted out already and you have a cup of something ready to listen to our talks today at your leisure. Thank you again for turning up and I hope you enjoy the programme. First up, we have a, a short talk from Di Rees, who is the new Head of Conservation for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Good morning and welcome to our online gathering. I'm Di Rees and I'm just going to spend a few minutes introducing myself and talking about our projects in Scotland, successes of the year so far and our work going forward. But before I do, my sincere apologies that you're seeing a recorded message rather than me in person this morning. Firstly though, I'd like to personally thank Paul Kirkland for his tremendous efforts and achievements over the many years he has worked with BC Scotland. From a personal perspective, 
Paul has laid many excellent foundations and built many great working relationships with yourselves and other partners and stakeholders. This has made stepping into this role a lot easier than it could have been, and I'm looking forward to continuing the work of BC in Scotland. For my part, I took a leap of faith in September last year to join Butterfly Conservation as the Head of Conservation in Wales. Prior to this, I was working for Natural Resources Wales and the Forestry Commission in Wales. Like many other charitable organisations, the outbreak of COVID-19 has meant that Butterfly Conservation has had to recognise and reorganise some existing posts and departments, and that is why my role has now been expanded to cover Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. Moving from a government-sponsored body to a charity like I have has been enlightening and challenging, and my overriding impression of volunteers, members, colleagues and trustees is one of passion and commitment, hard work and the unwavering certainty that although we may be a relatively small organisation, we very much punch above our weight and achieve some fantastic outcomes. Personally, I still have much to learn, but I'm very much looking forward to learning and working with you all. As Epiphany has already mentioned, the Species on the Earth project has just begun its development phase, and I'm delighted that David Hill from our Scottish office is now a development officer for this project, and he will be working on developing a number of species projects for the small blue, northern brown argus, New Forest Burnet Moth and the Slender Scotch Moth, Burnet Moth, amongst others. Some of our other successes this year have been we have secured further funding to deliver our highly successful BOD squad work and we will be undertaking an internal recruitment for this as David has moved to another position. We have added our support to a project to conserve the small blue in Ayrshire with our local branch we, and we have recently submitted a bid to Scottish Power to undertake work on the Northern Brown Argus, and if successful, we will be employing a full-time officer for a 12-month period. So even though this has been a difficult year, we are hoping to continue our successes going forward. As we are all aware, this has been, and continues to be, a very unusual and difficult year that has seen many enforced changes to how we live our lives and go about our business. The pandemic has meant that we have had to halt, or certainly curtail, much of our work, and this has been difficult to accept. But I have noticed over the recent months as people have been limited to the homes and local areas, the awareness of our natural world and what surrounds us has grown, and this raised awareness has given us opportunities to engage, educate and inform, and we must grasp these opportunities with both hands. Personally, I believe that communication, engagement and education is key to success. To paraphrase our President, Sir David Attenborough, the world belongs to young people. It is their generation that can make the difference and that is the most important hope. To nurture this raised awareness of our natural world and the part that moths and butterflies play is a responsibility for all of us. As well as continued engagement, one of Butterfly Conservation Scotland's primary primary focus is going forward will be the high priority species identified in the Scotland Conservation Strategy. It is these species that have been identified as vulnerable, endangered or near threatened that we will need to help by support and funding to try and reverse their decline. However, that's not to forget the importance of the less rare species and the role that they play as indicators of, of health and the state of our environment and the genuine pleasure and enjoyment they give to millions of people. As I was preparing for this talk, I realised that it's just over a year since I started with BC, and I reflected on what a strange and unprecedented year it's been. For me, personally, it's effectively been about learning a new way of working, and at times it's been a very steep, if not vertical, learning curve, with much to learn and understand. Being new to the charity sector was, and still is, a challenge, but one thing that has stood out for me is the realisation of the crucial role that you, as branch members, committees and volunteers, play in delivering our aims and objectives, engaging with people and making a real difference. I'm sorry that we can't meet in person this year. Before I hand over to the next speaker, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Butterfly Conservation for giving me the opportunity to take that leap of faith, but particularly to the team in Scotland, to Tom and David, Shona, Polly, Anthony and Patrick, for making me welcome and for their incredible support, knowledge and patience whilst I begin to learn the ropes 
and ask those inevitably daft questions which they have the patience to answer. Thank you so much for taking the time today to be part of this gathering, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the programme. Thank you. Right, so um, a little bit of an intro from me. Um, I've been interested in kind of moths since childhood as a sort of five-year-old, I think I started, um, but I've always been interested in their early stages. Um, you know, I've been running a moth trap since I was eight, but I uh, just don't know, moth traps, yeah, for me, there's kind of a means to an end rather than an end in itself. I'm always interested in trying to find a, a female moth to see if she'll lay me some eggs so I can rear them through. I'm always out there looking for things. and. I think um, over the many years that I've been, been uh, recording, I've always just had that yearn to look out for caterpillars. And why? Ah, there's something about the wonder and beauty of the, the metamorphosis of that change from egg through to larva to pupa to adult. But just, it's full of intrigue and challenge. You know, you put a moth trap on, it's fine. You get up in the morning, it might be like Christmas and you've got something amazing in there. But looking for caterpillars, kind of it's a bit more challenging it's a little bit harder and it requires just that little bit of guile and thought as to where these caterpillars are hiding so um, here we go 50 years on from my, my start of my interest here's my latest contribution um, as um, as co-author with barry henwood and uh, ably supported by the superb richard Livington. Um, this is the field guide to the caterpillars of great britain and ireland uh, which was uh, published earlier this year. Um, it's been about a five-year project. Um, we certainly I had to spend the first year raising sufficient money to pay Richard, because um, I don't know, Richard's a lovely guy, but he doesn't come cheap. Um, and, um, and basically we had to uh, get a contract with Bloomsbury to write the book, and then it needed illustrating, plus all the text and the work to do it. And so I think wrapping that up in five years is a pretty a pretty stern effort that's been required. Very, very fortunately, Barry Henwood is the top man, in, uh, I think, for looking for macro caterpillars in Britain, and he uh, fairly recently retired, and so was completely and freely available to get on with this project. So here's the team, and here we were. This was, I think, the 9th of March, so literally days before lockdown, and here we are actually sitting closely together. Yes, we used to sit close. Um, and here we are signing, signing the books um, in early March, just before lockdown. Um, uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know Barry, what a wonderful guy. If you ever get a chance to meet him, uh, do. Lovely, lovely chap. So, what about the, uh, the field guide? Why did we need, why was there such a desire for a new field guide to Caterpillars? Well, I think for many years, in fact, since about 1977, we've been relying on Jim Porter's identification guide to caterpillars and in its day this was groundbreaking this was the first time somebody had set about getting photographs of all uk species and presumably into one book absolutely brilliant but it relied on transparencies and as you can see from this slide those transparencies have got shade they've got brightness they've got a bit of glare they've got all sorts with them and mm. actually Though the book was groundbreaking, it was actually really quite hard to identify with certainty caterpillars based on that, on that guide. And, and there's been a real yearn for people to be able to say, well, I need to compare A with B and I need to know the special characters that tell me species A from species B. And so that's what we, uh, that's what we set about doing. And there's also this growing interest, you know, the huge numbers of people, what is just under 200 attending this morning, vast numbers of people interested in moths and butterflies. And, and we now have the internet, and that enables us to see images from all over Europe at an instant to be able to try and identify what we found. But bringing it all together in a field guide has been a real need. So, I think however much Barry and I have written, I think, perhaps understandably, the first thing people will always do is turn straight to the illustrations. And why? Because Richard Lewington is brilliant. He's an absolute star. What amazing, amazing illustrations he's able to produce 
with his um, with his brushes and indeed his iPad these days. Um, and what you notice about the illustrations here is they're all orientated in the same way. So they're all able to be compared one with another. They're scaled appropriately. And of course, there are no shadows or glare or whatever. So illustrations really help with a field guide because they do enable com comparisons with A and B. And so Rich's illustrations, and the, there's another sumptuous plate of, um, uh, of Southern Caterpillars done by Richard. I mean, what an absolute superstar. He's also a really nice guy to work with. So it's been a, a real pleasure to, to be part of this, um, part of this work. And I, I, you know, I hope many of you will have already bought the book and, um, and, we'll, and for those of you who haven't, will do so. So as well as the illustrations, which are fantastic for, and we've included, I think, virtually all species of macro moth and butterfly that you're likely to see in Britain. There will, of course, it's already out of date because there are other species that have now arrived and have colonized, but, but it's not bad. It's not bad. There's a lot there. In terms of the text, we tried to be reasonably concise, not to make it too lengthy. So I think um, giving you very short uh, descriptions of the larvae, the key features you're after, a little thumbnail map, um, uh, and field notes of when you're likely to find it, the food plants it might be on, but I think uh, critically what we've included is the similar species. And that is, those are the notes you really need to go to to help identify down to a specific level where that's possible. We've also included a, a load of about 200 photographs um, of the, uh, what do you call them? The, um, I suppose the, the telltale signs of where the larvae might be feeding. Um, we've also included right at the back there for the nerds amongst us, including my good self, is, um, is ta uh, tables of the really tricky groups. And I think for those of you who've ever gone out and looked at caterpillars at night, you'll have seen um, um, uh, wainscot larvae, and they are almost impossible. But we've done our best to give you uh, tables which give you sort of commentary, if you like, on whether you could or could not distinguish the species. And um, if you look at these uh, four photos here, on the left is a double line, and that double line is going to be a larva that you will be able to identify in the field, even though it's in the wainscot group. It just looks a bit dumpier and the lines are a bit more curved. But look at the other three species and you go, well, I can tell those apart. One's got lots of big black lines and the other one hasn't. Actually, they are so variable that these, these are three different species here. Um, uh, second in from the right is clay, and then striped wainscot, and then, and then brown line bright eye. But by the time you've seen a dozen of each of those, they all look the same, they all merge into one. And so it's extremely difficult to separate them. So we've put them into different groups and tried to help you along the way as to which you can and which you can't identify. Um, I think uh, one of this, a lot of debate over this, but we've included a list of plants and the species associated with them. And uh, we hope that this will be quite a helpful guide to for recorders, um, just gives them a, a guide as to what they're finding on the food plants. Two, two caveats, one is we don't know everything, so there's a lot of information yet to find about different food plants. And the second is there are an awful lot of species that are we described as polyphagous. There are many, many plants and we won't have included them all. Right, so let's just spend the next 10 minutes or so with some of that wonderment, some of the things that have really intrigued and interested me. Here's a, a photo of beautiful hook tip and you can see here's a classic caterpillar and many of them do. They're kind of very, very cryptic against the uh, background on which they're sitting. And here this beautiful hook tip on, on, on the lichen covered twig. But it's that, yes, you can see the green and the black, but look a bit more closely. Look at the, those extensions, the flanges that stick out from the side of the caterpillar those little finger-like extensions. Don't they just look like the finger-like extensions of the lichen sitting on that twig? So caterpillars have evolved this remarkable ability to be cryptic. And, and that's the sort of intrigue that I absolutely enjoy studying closely to see what's going on behind the doors. Here's another one. There's a fairly regular species. We see scalloped hazel moth. And it's a typical brown stick caterpillar. There's lots of those. People say, oh, they're all brown. How do you tell them apart? 
Well, in the book, we've given you some useful features. And if you look here, there's um, a couple of vestigial legs, pairs of vestigial legs on, on the, the abdominal segment of the scallop hazel. So if you've got a stick caterpillar that's brown, just have a look on the underneath. Has it got vestigial legs? And if so, that's likely to be scalloped hazel. So that, that helps us. But there's a lot more intrigue with scalloped hazel because scalloped hazel is quite a variable caterpillar and it produces a form like this. So here's the lichen form of the, um, of the scalloped hazel. But all scalloped hazel start kind of greeny brown when they're young and yet some of them turn into this lichen form. How on earth does that happen? How does that polymorphic character express itself? Well, Mike Majerus, um, what he did when he was rearing these, um, these scalloped hazel, he introduced little bits of white paper into the bottom of the container. And as the caterpillars changed into their last instar, in the containers which had little bits of white paper, they also changed into the lichen form. So here's something amazing about caterpillars is they're able to detect the background they're on. And if they have that polymorphism available to switch on and switch off the genes, which help them um, blend into the background, absolutely extraordinary. And this probably happens with a wide range of caterpillars that exhibit lots of color forms. All right, here's another sort of crypsis. Here's another sort of thing here. This, this is scalloped hook tip. And here's a caterpillar that um, like um, an insectivorous bird drop, just curled up nicely like that on the upper side of the leaf. Um, now this sort of crypsis works well when it's small, as in at the size that the scallop hook tip is actually, you know, when it's small it looks like a bird dropping, but as soon as the caterpillar gets into its fourth and fifth instar, it's too big to be a bird dropping, so the birds can recognize it as a caterpillar and then eat it, so it can't to remain as a bird dropping mimic. So as it gets bigger, the scallop hook tip changes into this. And you're thinking, well, here's a, here's a caterpillar that's still sitting on the upper side of a leaf. What's going on there? Because if you've ever been out to look for scallop hook tip, they're one of the easier caterpillars to find during the daytime, sitting as they do, quite openly. What's that about? I don't think we know, but one thought that I have is that it's, it's um, mimicking um, a mature, dry birch catkin. And if you look at the difference between the birch catkin and the, and the, and the, and the, um, the, the, the I suppose the folds of the skin of the scallop hook tip, it's a remarkable camouflage. I think. So just a thought there. Another species, older moth. Here's a young older moth, which is um, looking just like a wet bird's dropping out of a sparrow, isn't it? Um, and we don't quite know, oddly, they sit on the underside of the leaf quite sure about what goes on there, but it does look remarkably like a bird's drop. As the older moth caterpillar gets bigger, um, it has no chance, because this is going to be an inch, inch and a half long, no chance of looking like a bird dropping. The old moth changes dramatically and into its last instar becomes this remarkable, um, uh, I suppose, aposomatic, but it is one that's a warningly coloured caterpillar with its black and yellow and uh, presumably mimicking a wasp. Um, but it is tasty, so we think that this is a mimic that actually um, isn't beguiling. It's, uh, it's one of those uh, baiting mimics that uh, enables, enables its camouflage to work because it's mimicking um, insects that aren't actually tasteful or indeed dangerous. Right, talking of danger, let's look at this. This is not a British caterpillar. So here is Hemeroplanes trisolimus, and this is from uh, Central America, uh, quite regularly found in Costa Rica, one of the hawk moths. And I think all of us would say oh, that looks like a snake. It's much, much smaller than the snake, or quite a lot of snakes, but it absolutely looks like a snake. Take a note of the name and pop that into, um, into YouTube and you can have a look at the videos of Tryptolemus and you will see that not only does it look like a snake, it behaves like a snake. Um, and, and there are a whole range of these caterpillars in Central America which are doing this. So here's the, I suppose the ultimate, isn't it, is that if you can look like a snake, birds are not going to go and eat you. Do we have anything like that in this country? Well, I kind of think we do, and Barry and I certainly believe we do, is the elephant hawk moth. It's not a great leap of faith, is it, to move from Tryptolemus to our own elephant hawk moth, to 
see the same shape, the expanded segments at the front end of the body and these big eye spots as being something like a snake, some, something about that. And here we see Phil Barden's dog this year in, um, in Devon, which came across an elephant hawk moth on a, on a willow herb in the garden and was going absolutely nutty over this caterpillar. So clearly whatever's going on, there are animals that are in some respects alarmed when they see this pattern that's on a caterpillar. I mean, it's just a caterpillar, it's, uh, it's not a, but here is something that the dog has recognized as being a, a, of concern, of interest, perhaps of danger. And here's one that, oh, these, are my, these are my own photos that, that uh, kind of hit the cuttings floor, I think, during the, uh, during, during the making of the book. But oleander hawk moth, not something I think we'd expect to see as a larva in this country. I saw these in, um, in Turkey uh, not that long ago. Wonderful, wonderful species. I mean, it's cryptic, beautifully cryptic. I mean, look at the white lines down the, uh, down, down the side of the body looking just like the uh, midrib of the, of the uh, vein of the leaf and this wonderful green colour. But you tap that on the front end of the head and it's dramatically different. It produces these extraordinary electric blue eye spots and um, something that I've certainly not seen and I've not seen uh, elsewhere in literature that um, Oleander hawk moth produces these eye spots and they're an instant reaction when you tap it on the head as if a bird was having a go. And, and I'm sure this is a startle reaction and possibly also so what is going on here? What is all this about uh, snake mimicry? Well, um, birds are hardwired to recognize that, that, um, that, uh, that the snakes are to be avoided and they recognize it through the patterns. I mean, if you think about it, the snake is um, uh, a, you know, a predator of birds. And if a bird is going to um, uh, avoid a snake, and that's not something that, like most mimicry, it, got, um, it can go and um, test it out. And so a bird can only learn once, basically. And over evolutionary time, we believe that uh, rather than it being a learned behavior to avoid snakes, it's hardwired in to the brains of birds. And being hardwired in, it's unlikely to be um, a, 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 an image of a snake that you and I would recognize as a snake. It's very likely to be a pattern of colors and shapes and, and the sorts of things we're talking about are an expanded head, eye spots and, and contrasting colors. And if that's the pattern that birds are recognizing, then we can look across the Lepidoptera and say, do these patterns occur in nature elsewhere? And, oh look, in our own dark spectacle, we've got same kind of eye spots, yellow patterns, slightly expanded um, um, up towards the head. In some respects, if you were a bird that are hardwired to looking for um, caterpillars and you come across some visual cues that hit, meet the pattern of snake, you will instantly avoid it. If there are plenty more caterpillars to go and find, but you will instantly avoid it. And that is the key to how we think caterpillars can afford to be so much smaller than snakes is its pattern recognition that birds are going for rather than the size of the snake. So if they're going through mixed vegetation, then they're able to, um, to just pick up some of the cues and avoid instantly. And this happens across the, uh, the tropics in vast, vast numbers, but we even think it's happening here in some of our species of Lepidoptera. And here's a pupa even. And you can see the black eye spots and the pale colour behind. This is a pupa of lilac beauty moth. Now lilac beauty moth, unlike the species all around it, sits openly on the underside of a leaf with hardly, it's a bit more like a butterfly um, cocoon with a strand of silk. Um, it doesn't hide away in a cocoon so it's quite open to, to be seen and yet here it is um, with its um, possible snake mimicry associated with it. Now, I recognize this is all circumstantial evidence and we don't really know, but it's part of the intrigue that drives me to be really, really interested in caterpillars and, uh, and to share that with you today. Other things we use caterpillars, well, you know, caterpillars tell us exactly where, um, where the moth is living or the butterfly is living. And that's a really important conservation tool. 
um, we can all run moth traps. And, and for many of us down this part of the world, you know, occasionally we get the odd dingy mocker in our trap. It's a red data book species. Hurrah, I found a red data book species in my garden. What does it mean? It means that that moth's got four wings and it's been flying around a bit. What we actually need to know is where it's breeding and on what parts of the plant. It's a willow feeder dingy mocker. But actually the work that Mark Parsons and the moth team have done over many years down here is to establish not just which, uh, which willows it's on, but also the size of the willows and the management that was required to look after those willows. And they much prefer the young bushes that are perhaps no more than two, three, four years old or have been regularly cut back and therefore are regrown. So studies of caterpillars actually give us a real insight into the conservation of Lepidoptera. And also, um, they, um, they give us a bit of an insight into what is and isn't establishing in this country. Um, flame brocade moth, which is, oh, very soon it'll be out in this part of the world. I'm afraid it's a long, long way from Scotland at the moment, but to give it a few more decades of climate change, you might well find it up, up, up in the borders. Um, but at the moment, it's um, thought to be, or at least in years ago thought to be established in southern Britain because the numbers of the moths in the moth traps are very high. In reality nobody knows until they go out and find the caterpillars and so just before we published um, Barry and I went out to Portland where the numbers are big, uh, you know, really substantial numbers in 2030 in a moth trap and by careful searching on kind of garden weeds uh, we managed to find a dozen caterpillars and of course that then instantly confirms that the species is either resident or a transitory resident um, in, in that location. So the study of caterpillars tells us all sorts of things. It's wonderful, it's intriguing, but it tells us about the conservation and it tells us about, the, um, about how they're doing and how far north or west or south that they're moving. Okay, so there we have it. That's a, a quick flying introduction into the uh, into world of caterpillars. Um, I, you know, I hope you, if you've not had a chance to get out and enjoy using the book, that you, uh, you do that this winter. Um, and I will leave you with, um, well, I was a blushing review from, uh, from Peter Mack. Um, I have to say, it's been a great pleasure to be uh, part of this field guide. And, and um, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, it seems to be very well received. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to tell you all about it. Thanks very much, Phil. That was fascinating. I don't, I don't know if we've ever had um, a talk dedicated just to caterpillars before, so that was great. And um, we've got a few questions in the chat box. Um, we've got some time to answer them. So the first one is, uh, how would you advise a beginner to get started on looking for caterpillars? Are there some good places to look to start off with? Uh, what's the best time of year? Right, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bethany. Um, and thank you for that question. Um, there is not a time of year when you can't go out and look for caterpillars. And in fact, the winter is a very good time. So from now on, all the way through, and particularly in Scotland, I mean, Scotland just hangs on to so many moths that we've lost down this part of the world. And looking for, if I want to go and find lots of caterpillars, I go to Scotland, basically. It's wonderful up there. Whether it's the moorlands, um, so moorlands are a good place to start, uh, sand dunes are good, but I'd also don't overlook those little lanes with the stone walls at the base of the stone walls where you've got frankly a load of weeds and bits and pieces and there might be a bit of heath bed straw and something else. If you're walking the dog, take a, you know, and it's dark, it tends to get dark in Scotland a bit early, um, go and take your torch out there and shine the torch up and down the base of the walls and just see what you find. Um, you'll be surprised at just how many of the caterpillars there are at night. Clearly don't do it in a desperate frost or the snow, that's not going to work, but in mild damp conditions is absolutely ideal. And then what you need to do, find those caterpillars, um, uh, pop them in a pot, but note which food plants they're on and try to give them that food plant to feed on. And then, um, and then you can grow them up. You will need to grow them up if they are small um, because to identify caterpillars to species can be hard anyway, but um, you give yourself the best chance if they're in their last instar, the instar before they're going to pupate. And then if you compare them with the pictures in the guide and read the descriptions and perhaps look on the internet as well, 
you've got a reasonable chance of being able to, to identify them. And do make sure you clean them out every day, every other day, because um, if you leave them sitting in poo, surprise, surprise, they get diseased and die. So we'd rather didn't do that. So keep them reasonably dry and, and in a pot, in a, in, a, in a sensible place in the, in the house, and they should be fine. Great, that's great advice. I found lots of uh, dew moth ba uh, caterpillars basking on stone walls near me this year. So oh, that's idea. oh amazing. Oh, dew moth. I'd love to see it down here. Yeah. That's a lovely footman moth. Are really interesting. Um, uh, the dew moth is one of the footman moth, and, and this is one. Dew moth is an orange species with black dots on it. Um, footman moth. We know very little about the life histories of them. Really, I think we, they were always assumed to be feeding on lichens. But the more we've looked, the more we found that, yeah, I think dew moth probably does eat lichens. Um, but if you want redneck footmen, then that's feeding on, on uh, algae on the trees, on pleurococcus algae on trees. But common footmen, scarce footmen, buff footmen, dingy footmen, they're all eating all sorts of things, grass and bramble and lichens and dead leaves, all sorts. And um, they've got a remarkable number of instars. You know, I think, I think the standard of butterflies and moths is they have five instars and and that's it, they turn into their pupa and, and that's the end of it. Well, for some of the footmen, they've got 12 or 13 instars. They're forever changing wow. their names. What's that about? We have no idea. Great, and while well, talking about lichen, we have a question in the, in the chat box from Andy Barker, who says, lichen feeding species have generally fared well over recent decades due to improved air quality. Are there other groups of moths that have fared better in response to environmental change? Oh, great, Andy. Yes. Well, the most obvious ones are, are the species that are, you know, good dispersers. So it's the, the what's happening. I mean, it, the, what's extraordinary is that moths are this amazing indicator of a changing climate. Now, whether that's a warming climate or a cooling climate or a climate that's changing and induced by man or not, um, is that moths and butterflies, butterflies a little less so, but, but, but moths across the board are responding. So some species are moving north and can no longer survive in this part of the world. So where I am sat in Weymouth, um, perhaps 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, something like the grey kai moth, which I know you find on moorlands um, in the north and the west, um, that, that was still present here, gone and now gone for the last 20 years. So here's a species retreating northwards. But for every one that's retreating northwards, there are 10 or 20 that are moving up from Europe and now establishing here. And, and so the, the, what we do notice, clean air or not clean air, we notice that the, the fauna is almost certainly increasing in this country as a result of invasion from, from the continent and from establishment as those milder winters are meaning that more species can, can get a toehold here. And then either they're adapting to local conditions or they're just, we are, we are seeing. But we're seeing remarkable changes now. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. And we've got another question which says, um, are snake patterned caterpillars completely unpredated by birds or have some birds overridden this fear? Well, that's a really good point. Um, I don't think we really know the answer to that. Um, if you want to look up the research papers, then the top guy is Professor Daniel Janssen, J-A-N-Z-E-N, and he's, um, I think he's based in the Smithsonian Institute. Um, but I follow, follow Dan Janssen and, and look through those papers, and I suspect there are experiments where they've looked at um, predation of um, uh, snake mimicking caterpillars to look to see if they are ever predated. I would be very surprised if they're not predated because birds, birds are hungry um, and, and the, of course they will, if they don't pick up the cues that are um, uh, eliciting that, uh, that uh, avoidance response, then, then of course they, they will be eaten. And there's no reason to suppose that these caterpillars aren't anything other than completely edible. Um, I think it is true that at least in this country, none of the snake mimics are also uh, distasteful. Um, and might be there are others out there who will claim different, but as far as I know, so it is, it's not something where it seems incidental. 
I mean, I think that wouldn't be good for the argument about snake mimicry if, if all snake mimics were also distasteful caterpillars, you know, a bit like cinnabar moth or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm reasonably convinced that, that, that this, if it does elicit that response, then, then it's a, a real response. Great. Thanks, Bill. We've got time for another question, so I'm going to take one more. Um, Charlotte says that she has reared two generations of silver Y caterpillars, and the second generation appeared to complete pupation much quicker than the first. Would this be due to a need to migrate? Oh, great question. Um, it, well, we're learning a lot about migration migration of moths and I say we, that's we in the general sense, it's not me personally. Um, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology have been doing some considerably amazing work on moth migration and indeed insect migration with their vertical look radar and what that's showing us is that that migration in moths and beetles and dragonflies and hoverflies is much much more complex than we thought and that there are species that are moving north uh, that are dispersing north to find new food and, and dispersing north during the summer, but they also go back. Some of them are going back, but not all of them. Um, and, and so we have a very complex picture about what's going on. There's no one simple explanation. In terms of the, um, in what's happening with silver wise, um, it, it sort of depends on, on you know, once they're indoors, then they are in very mild climate and, and obviously are feeding them well and looking after them. So it's not at all surprising that they rush through their generations rather quicker than they would do outdoors. But if this is the case where the, the first time you reared them, they were from eggs, and then the second time you reared them also from eggs, so directly comparable, and the second time that they, they were much quicker than the first, which is how I understand it, then it's, it's very difficult to kind of control all of those variables and particularly temperature because silver wire is so, so responsive to temperature. And you, know, you just have to ask yourself, was it slightly a degree or two warmer in the room between the first generation and the second generation? Or is that really a, a changed behavior? I mean, the answer is we don't really know. Don't be too surprised if there is a changed behavior between generations because we think there is. I mean, hence butterflies migrating back south um, and, and, but, but, but I would doubt whether it's an absolute. So I think a very interesting question and kind of keep studying because people making these observations is really helping us to understand what's going on with our moths and butterflies. Thank you. Yes, as the Pithy says, um, I'm going to be talking about Northern Brown Argus um, and in particular um, how it is Fading in the Scottish Borders area. Um, and over the last year, I've been working on this project called Saving the Northern Brown Argus in the Scottish Borders, um, which has been kindly funded by the National Lotteries Heritage Fund. Um, the project's really focused on raising awareness of this butterfly and um, using uh, assessing volunteer data, uh, which has been collected to look at the threats to habitat that this sorry, the, the threats to the habitat of Northern Brown Argus. Um, and hopefully this will improve the long-term future for the butterfly. Um, I'm just going to start a little bit by talking about the, some background to the butterfly um, for anyone who's not so familiar with it. Um, so Northern Brown Argus is a small butterfly and despite its brown appearance, it belongs in the blues family. So it's a little bit smaller than a common blue butterfly, which hopefully most people will be familiar with. It's fairly widespread in our countryside. Um, the distinguishing feature for Northern Brown Argus in Scotland is that the butterfly has a very prominent white spot on each forewing. This distinguishes it from every other butterfly that you're likely to see in Scotland. Um, and it's sometimes known as Edinburgh's butterfly, because it was first documented or, found or uh, described to science from specimens found on Arthur's seat in Edinburgh way back in the 18th century. Um, and it's still found there today on, on Arthur's seat in Salisbury Crags, doing relatively well in a thriving city. Northern Brown Argus 
is not a species that most people are likely to see in their gardens or on the average road verge. It's very much a habitat specialist and it's rarely seen away from its preferred habitats. The reason for that is that its food plant is a rather fussy caterpillar that the butterfly has. And the food plant for the butterfly is common rock rose, which in itself is quite a fussy plant and prefers thin rocky soils and dry and, and drier kind of situations. So it's not necessarily a butterfly that you're going to see widespread. It's one of those species that you have to really go and seek out. Um, the butterfly inhabits small patches of flower rich grasslands. Um, and the rock rose is usually found amongst other species such as wild thyme and harebell, birds with trefoil, yarrow, torment hill. And together we usually call this habitat species rich grassland. Um, the butterfly can be found on the coast on steep grasslands and inland it can be found on south facing slopes usually quite often above rivers and streams. Colonies of northern brown argus tend to be quite small um, over the season. Um, there may be less than 100 northern brown argus in each colony. Um, unfortunately, it's the species rich grassland habitats which northern, argus, which northern brown argus depends on have long been in widespread decline. Um, species rich grasslands are a fantastic habitat, not just for northern brown argus, but for a whole range of butterflies invertebrates, pollinators such as bees, ants, everything. It's such a rich, wonderful thing to have. Unfortunately, we think at least 95% of species rich grasslands in the UK have been lost in the last 100 years. And that's probably a conservative estimate. It's perhaps more like 99% of these habitats have been lost. Unfortunately, we know that Northern Brown Argus is suffering. Um, butterfly conservation's data has shown that in the last, well, since the mid-1970s, uh, northern brown argus has, to, has contracted in range by around 27%. Or to put it another way, about one in four sites where northern brown argus used to be found, it can no longer be found. Um, the species is a priority species for us in Scotland. It's, it's a, a, quite a high priority in our conservation strategy. And it's also on the Scottish biodiversity list. Um, here is a map of the distribution of northern brown argus. So you can see that it is a northern butterfly in the UK. There are some colonies of the butterfly in England. Uh, these are in North Yorkshire and Lancashire and Northumberland. But most of its distribution is within Scotland. And generally speaking, it's an eastern species that likes those drier climates. However, it can be found on the Solway and Ayrshire coast. Um, but I did say at the start, I was gonna focus on the Scottish borders area. And hopefully you can all see there on the map that there's a real cluster of dots in the borders, which has long been regarded as quite a stronghold for this species. Back in 2016, um, volunteers in the borders started to survey all known colonies of northern brown argus. Um, this was in response to a perceived perhaps threat to the, to the butterfly's habitats. Um, Barry Prater, um, Butterfly Conservation's volunteer organiser in the borders, um, has done an absolutely sterling effort by collating all of the known records of the butterfly and mapping out the colonies. And he identified around 150 potential colonies. And over the, over the last few years, with, with a solid band of volunteers who have been fantastic, um, 129 of these sites have now been surveyed. And the aim of the surveys has really been to see if Northern Brown Argus is still present at each of these colonies, if, if, it, if Northern Brown Argus's habitat is still present, and to make a rough assessment of how that habitat is doing. Along the way, uh, 14 previously unknown colonies have been discovered. Um, this is largely just because more people are out there looking for Northern Brown Argus, more folk are interested and know what to look for. Um, the fact that 14 new sites have been discovered 
really shows that it's actually quite an under-recorded butterfly and that there's probably many more colonies out there waiting. Northern brown argus is quite an elusive butterfly. Um, you can go to sites where, um, there's, where there's known to be, where the butterfly is known to be on sunny days in the right season and not see it. Um, it's, it's small and brown, it's fast flying. Even if you spot one, it can be quite difficult to follow or get a good view of it. So, there's a, but there is actually a straightforward way to look for the species and that's by looking for its eggs. So the butterfly lays relatively conspicuous single white eggs on the top side of rock rose leaves. And by getting down on your hands and knees, it's usually quite easy to spot these eggs. Uh, the butterfly flies um, from late May through right through until August. Um, so you can really look for eggs from late June, July and August. And even once the caterpillar is hatched, the remains of the egg are usually still attached to the top side of the leaf and they can be spotted. This is also really useful because it confirms that the butterfly is breeding at that site. Um, and I found this year that you can also hone in on areas of rock rows where northern brown argus caterpillars are feeding by looking for the larval feeding damage. Uh, there's a great photo on the right here of, from uh, Jim Asher, which shows the larval feeding of caterpillars on rock rose leaves. The caterpillar feeds from the underside of the leaf and leaves these quite obvious um, patches. So it's quite useful for honing in on an area where northern brown argus might be um, feeding. And usually you can find an egg after seeing this damage. Um, so to the survey results, um, of all the sites that have been surveyed, Northern Brown Argus has been found at around 71% of sites. Whoops. Um, sorry, I lost my track there. Um, so perhaps at 29% of sites, um, Northern Brown Argus could have been lost. However, we don't think it's that bad. We think um, because common rock crows has actually been found at 94% of all sites that have been surveyed, it's perhaps possible that northern brown argus has just been missed. Um, it quite often needs more than one survey to find it at a site. So, so it's hopeful that perhaps not too many northern brown argus colonies in the borders have been lost. Um, so that's the good news. Um, slightly less good news perhaps um, is from the assessments of habitat that volunteers have been carrying. So 65 sites have been deemed to have no current threat, um, but there's a range of issues affecting some other sites. These include um, invading bracken and scrub, um, afforestation and a new woodland establishment, and overgrazing by stock are all common issues that have been highlighted at Northern Brown Argus sites. And the rather grim assessment is that 48% of sites or colonies can be considered as being under threat or in declining condition. Um, one of the main causes of this appears to be insufficient grazing. Um, so we think around 32 colonies are affected by this at the moment, where the flower rich habitats are becoming choked out by scrub, bracken and gorse, um, and rank grasses that are overtaking um, the rock rows that the northern brown argus needs. Um, these are areas that once upon a time cattle and sheep would have grazed quite extensively and created quite a nice varied um, vegetation sward. Um, unfortunately, due to um, the long-term decline in upland agricultural economics, um, it's not always um, economically sustainable to, to graze these areas for farmers and uh, sites are falling out of condition. Conversely, overgrazing can still be an issue and uh, this is affecting um, around 14 colonies, we think. Um, common rock rose is quite good at surviving um, under 
heavy grazing, but what tends to happen is the plant becomes quite prostrate, um, whereas northern brown argus is known to prefer quite bushy rock rose plants. Um, and there's also a general lack of nectar sources and the grassland structure is lost. There's less diversity in the structure um, and the microclimates and habitats that northern brown argus probably likes are lost. Um, and the third and final um, problem for northern brown argus is um, woodland management and um, establishment of new woodlands. Um, this, as we probably all know, the Scottish government's got some really um, quite um, strong and welcome targets for increasing the amount of woodlands we have in Scotland. And in the long term, hopefully that will be fantastic for our biodiversity. Um, but there is a risk that um, some insensitive planting can, can occur on these often small patches of species rich grassland which often aren't picked up um, in the planning of new woodlands. Um, so we've, that's been a cause of quite a number of colonies in the borders where planting has occurred um, either on species rich grassland habitat or near it. Um, there's also another issue where um, at one time these sites would obviously have been grazed and um, by planting up with woodlands the grazing is now being removed and so even if the species rich grassland isn't planted and is still open um, it can become choked out um, as scrub and bracken move in as grazing is removed. Um, so that's the bad news. Um, a slightly better news perhaps is the fact that we are now in a position with Northern Brown Argus that we've never really been in with any other butterfly in Scotland before. And that's where we can actually map out exactly where the butterfly is habiting, inhabiting. So this is the Yarrow Valley um, near Selkirk in the borders. And these red areas are where Northern Brown Argus colonies are known to exist. So these are the mapped areas where the colony uses the nectar sources and the rock rows where the butterfly is found. Um, and we can also map out where we think Northern Brown Argus colonies are based on past records and rock rose records. So we now have this fantastic data set showing us exactly where these species are. Or where this species is. Um, so what's the future for Northern Brown Argus and the borders? Well, we do still need to survey and monitor. There's some sites that haven't been surveyed yet and hopefully we'll get around to those in the next year or two. But we need to keep surveying and we need to keep monitoring and seeing how these sites are doing. Um, a number of sites have been identified where conservation action could take place, perhaps to tackle gorse or scrub um, invasion. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to move forward with that. And perhaps most important of all, we just need to continue to raise awareness of the butterfly and its habitat. Um, we need to get our data out there it can be the salvation for this species. We need to be able to work with other land management, with, with those who are making land management decisions in the borders and use our data to help protect species rich grassland. Not just for Northern Brown Argus, but for everything that um, relies on species rich grassland. Um, so I think that is me, but I just want to say thank you um, to the National Lottery's Heritage Fund and a huge thank you to, um, I've listed some of the volunteers there who have helped me over the last year and have well, been so, so helpful um, to this project, but I perhaps missed some names, so apologies if I have. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. That was a really interesting talk and some really um, important issues raised there about species rich grassland. Um, you talked about forestry being an issue, and I was just wondering. Um, are the, the areas of forestry that you're coming across, are they mostly non-native plantations or broadleaf? Because I've found it certainly um, when I've been looking at species rich grasslands, sometimes the landowners plant native woodland thinking they're doing a really great thing, but actually they've accidentally planted on species rich grasslands. So um, yeah, what, what have you found? Um, yeah, I think it, it can be a mix and there's a real mix of um, new woodlands that have been created in the borders at the moment. Um, quite often, I suspect, 
the areas where northern brown argus is inhabiting um, are the areas that are more likely to be planted with broadleaves because it's steeper slopes um, above rivers and streams, quite often in areas where um, they will be using broad leaves, even if there's a larger sitka or um, spruce um, part of the plantation, it will be on the broadleaf section that the northern brown argus might be affected. Um, but yeah, I would generally say it's a mix of, um, and it, it really depends on each, each scheme that's happening. But on the positive side, I think there is much more broadleaf planting happening in the borders than there used to be, which is... Well, that's good. I guess it really comes down to um, an education issue, like to the untrained eye, species rich grasslands can be quite difficult to identify, even especially when they're not in flower, you know, a lot of people don't really know what they are. So it's, it's like you said, spreading awareness and teaching people about, about it. Yes, and um, these sites can, uh, often areas that are being planted are quite large, and often the area of species rich grassland, it might be 0.1 of a hectare, really yeah. small. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a question here in the box that says, is there a minimum area that a colony needs um, to occupy? In other words, would planting rock rows ourselves in a garden be enough or not? Um, well, there has been some work in the north of England um, by um, one, of our, one of our colleagues at BC, Sam Ellis, who um, found that Northern Brown Argus colonies really need about 0.1 of a hectare minimum to survive. I think I've got that figure right. Um, however, probably some of these sites in the borders that are smaller than that. And, you know, I'm sure some of the volunteers would report that on some of these sites, there's very little rock rows. I was at a site recently, not in the borders, but in the Ockle Hills, where I only found three rock rose plants, but I did find northern brown argus eggs. So it can survive, I suspect, on very small sites. Um, yes, you could plant rock rose in your garden, and well, I have heard of tales where rock rose has been planted close to northern brown argus colonies, and people have seen northern brown argus in their gardens, and eggs have been laid. Um, so, so yes, but um, only if Northern Ireland is close to you, it's unlikely to find its way to you if you're 30 miles from the nearest colony. Okay, thank you. Um, another one from Andy Barker saying, in England, brown argus has seen range expansion by shifting onto geranium species as an alternative food plant to rock rose. Has Northern brown argus shown any sign of doing this? Um, I think there has been some evidence of northern brown argus or um, maybe some circumstantial evidence of northern brown argus feeding on other plants. Um, I've not heard that reported in the borders area, but I have seen mention of it in southwest Scotland. Um, again, um, I think um, cranes bills and uh, plants like that have been suggested. Okay. And one from Bill Higgins that says, uh, has BC tried to interact with the Scottish government to highlight these areas, I think possibly in relation to the tree planting? Um, well, we are, we are working with Scottish forestry um, at the moment and we've had, we have good links with Scottish forestry. Um, and we are, well, I'm, I'm due to talk to some of their officers in uh, the south of Scotland soon to hopefully highlight these issues and then um, see how we can work together to well, hopefully create a better future for northern brown argus and species rich grassland. Great. Oh, Jim Asher, another northern brown argus enthusiast, has just popped up here saying, I did find one northern brown argus egg on Dyer's green weed. Um, I assume that's in southwest Scotland. Uh, and one more question. I was just wondering, um, so the borders is a very heavily farmed area and I just wondered what, have you interacted with landowners in this project and what kind of response were you getting from them? Were they quite interested um, in finding out that Northern Brown Argus was on their land once you explained things to them? Um, yeah, unfortunately I couldn't get out in the ground much. Oh, of course, COVID. <laughs> COVID. Um, but um, the volunteers that have been out over the last few years have have well, they've done quite a good job in chatting to a lot, chatting to a lot of landowners, um, and I think it's a bit of a mixed picture. Um, some are quite receptive, some are quite receptive, um, but I think at the end of the day, um, money is the bottom line for most people, uh, yeah. and 
you know, if it's if, if it's a site that we can come on and clear gorse, generally a farmer will, or a landowner will be quite happy with that because they see gorse as an issue. Um, but in terms of them being able to graze it, you know, they can't find the money to put sheep or cattle on a site that needs to be grazed, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. And one more question from me. Are you still looking for volunteers? And do you think there's potential that there are undiscovered colonies still in borders that people could go out and have a look for? Yes. Um, so um, we did a little bit of work thanks to uh, help of a really useful volunteer, Michelle Stamp, this year, who um, looked at GIS. So she got all the rock rose records and mapped them on south facing slopes. So we have a hit list of places that we would like people to visit because we think anywhere that there is rock rows in the borders on a south facing slope, there is a really good chance that Northern Brown Argus might be there. Um, and there's still 21 or so sites that still need to be visited. So yes, more volunteers the merrier. Fantastic. And do people email you about that or is it Barry? Yes, or? yes feel free to email me or Barry Prater in first instance for now. Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much, David. So here's, um, here's an angle shades moth. Here's a familiar site, I think um, almost countrywide, um, uh, you know, which is around from this time of the year. Probably there's not a month in a year without an angle shades, but it's one of those brilliant moths, isn't it? Isn't it a moth to, a moth to show children, a moth to show anybody who's never really been interested in moths. So see here are moths with their four wings and here's a moth that actually crunches its wings up at the uh, at the apex, you know, to look like a bit of scrunch leaves and with its triangular patterns on the wing. And I think it's a lovely moth. Now, in this part of the world, it'd be very interesting to know what happens in Scotland. But from now on, we start finding caterpillars of this beast all the way through the winter. Um, and they're feeding on a, a wide range of um, herbs and, and, and other broadleaf plants in the garden. Uh, in this part of the world, they just love comfrey, or that tall echium, pinnanana, you know, the, the, the uh, tree echium um, that grows so well down here these days. And larvae all through the winter, so nice to see. Um, let's uh, so, see what we've got. Oh, here's something you won't see in Scotland, I'm afraid. At least I don't think so. Um, I'd be very surprised. Um, here is the feathered ranunculus moth. So this is a sort of medium-sized notchard. Um, it's really a sort of coastal thing um, along south southern England coast, a little bit up um, the east and certainly up the west, and um, tends to exist in fairly isolated colonies. So if I were to go to the Isle of Wight, which I can kind of almost see from where I am in Weymouth, um, the, the majority of the individuals there are very pale and they seem to be matching the uh, chalk cliff background on which uh, they tend to be associated. Yet if I go down to the Isles of Scilly, it's a dark, dark moth with um, almost blackish banding um, on the forewings. And again, reflecting the darker rocks that this is um, where this, cat, this moth occurs. But it is spreading slowly inland. Uh, so it's, uh, it used to be entirely coastal, but now it's scattered throughout Dorset, certainly up to the, uh, to the South Wiltshire border. So a species that, again, might be responding to a tad of a warming climate. Um, we've got, um, oh, here's a familiar species, I'm sure we'll, we'll have all seen, for those of us who are regularly moth trapping, probably seen plenty of them. I can just work out where my camera is. Oh, there we go. Um, so here is a um, flounce rustic. Ooh. Just, just focus on that. Just, uh, there we go. So plants rustic moth, this is a particularly dark individual. Usually they're a palish brown, but this one's um, you know, quite dark, quite small individual. And, and I would say for this time of the year, even here is, is a bit late, you know, early October. This is a species that's around from yeah, mid, mid, mid to late August and right the way throughout September. So nice to see. Um, oh, yes. Little treasure trove, isn't it? Really, see what see what see what's in my little cold box. 
Um, let's see if we can get this one doing its stuff because it's a it's a lot it's it's rather more fun. Oh, here we go. So there we have Bard um, Bard Sallow. Now somebody will have to tell me about Bard Sallow because I haven't instantly. I've got one hand on the on the pot and I can't get to my book as to whether Bard Sallow does it get as far north as Scotland. That will be a. I might just have to see if I can check that one out. I can now move my hands. Um, beautiful moth. Uh, it's it's a beach feeder, um, so it's uh, something that I don't normally see in this part of the world. Um, it needs to be in sort of beach woodlands more than anything. Uh, just check out Bard Solo five eight. Um, somebody will already have come to the answer and popped it on the chat, but I haven't got enough hands to look at that. Bard Sallow gets up to northern England, but not quite, not quite really. It's Cumbria is about as far north as it seems to get. So a while to go yet before perhaps that's getting to Scotland, but it's certainly spreading in southern England. Um, and there's beautiful form here. It does have a form with the yellow band in the middle that's um, bright orange. So it's um, quite a spectacular piece. All right, what else? Oh, here's something that has reached the Scottish borders. And back to Andy Barker's comments about species that are moving north. Um, here is the Blair's shoulder knot moth. So this was in the trap this morning. Um, a, a sort of narrow winged greyish moth, with these darker streaks in the wings. Um, this species, 40, 50 years ago, first specimen uh, was, I think, found in um, on the Isle of Wight. Um, by, um, I can't remember the first name, but uh, Kenneth Blair, was it? No, not, uh, it's one of the Blairs, anyway, he used to work in the Natural History Museum, and there are three moths named after him, as in Blair's shoulder knot, Blair's mocker, and Blair's wainscot. When he retired to the other one, he found all three, really quite quickly. This species, now well established throughout most of Britain, has just, just reached the borders. Um, the caterpillars of that are on um, cypress trees and also on juniper. So when it does get properly established in uh, Scotland, it has plenty to eat. Um, oh, here's some. Um, I was talking about wainscots in my talk earlier. Um, this is the L album wainscot, the white L wainscot. Just see if you just get a bit better focus on that. Um, is that not bad? Is that all right? Um, oh, yeah, that's better. Uh, so this is the L album or the white L wainscot. You can tell that from the um, L shaped white mark in the middle of the wing. Uh, this species is fully established now um, along the south coast from Kent to Cornwall. Um, uh, when I was recording as a teenager, wow, this was a rarity. Fantastic to go down to Cornwall at this time of the year, down to the lizard and pop a moth trap out and see if you could find it. But now, yep. On it and probably on its way north. I know there are certainly examples found as far north as Hertfordshire, and I don't think it'll be long before it's uh, properly established throughout um, much of central southern England and up into the South Midlands. Um, let's see what else? A little treasure trove. Oh, yes. I'm going to show a micro moth. Look at that, eh? If it doesn't fly off, hopefully not. Um, now there's Rusty Dot Pearl. Uh, Rusty Dot Pearl um, again is a, an immigrant species, uh, but you can see from the markings on that how fresh this example is. And in, I would say in the last decade, this species is now a regular resident in my garden here down in Weymouth. And again, I found the larvae all winter, um, not necessarily outdoors all winter, but they're a, a, a common uh, <clears throat> problem on my winter lettuces in the greenhouse. Um, so the, uh, I tend to find that if I'm going through, or hoping to have a really beautiful winter cos, then open that up and there are usually one or two larvae lurking in there somewhere helping themselves. So it's, um, you know, I, I can see this moth now pretty much every day of the year in the garden in one form or another, as either as larvae or adults. So here's the species again, what's once, you know, not, a, not an uncommon migrant, but certainly a, nice to see, but now properly resident in this part of the world. Um, am I doing all right on time and things there, uh, Anthony? Are you comfortable? I've got lots more moths. 
Yes, please. Yeah, plenty please of keep time. going, Phil. Yep. Plenty. Of, please keep going. We can keep going. Oh, <laughs> we were talking about silver wire earlier, weren't we? Um, so here's. It's always if difficult to show on on these things because of their. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not too bad. Um, it's cold, so it's not it's not dead. It's just rather cold. Uh, but there you can see a silver Y in profile. So you can see the Y shape. Um, the way you're looking at it is, of course, upside down. Um, but look at the beautiful crest of scales, uh, mainly on the thorax, that um, sort of tuft of scales. But the one behind it is actually at the top end of the abdomen. And so part of the uh, crypsis that this moth uh, is engaged in is, is breaking up that pattern that's moth-shaped, as in that rather triangular shape. And with these tufts of scales, um, that's typical of, uh, of, of this group of moths in the silver Y group, the plesionine, uh, which break up their patterning um, but with these additional tufts of scales. Silver Y, um, yeah, pretty much resident all year. There, there will be, and particularly in a cold winter, there will be no chance of finding larvae through the winter. Um, but this moth migrates from Southern Europe and from North Africa um, at any time. So if we get a warm spell or winds from the Sahara deserts bringing up a plume of sand, uh, then silver Y will almost certainly be within it. Okay. Um, uh, oh, yes. Um, another species I don't often see in my garden here, but it's uh, it's it is common on right on the coast. So there's a possibility this is moving inland a little bit now. And here's a feathered brindle. Um, so th this is a coastal species. Um, oh, that's better, excellent. Um, and uh, it's a September, early October moth. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think in the last 25 years I've been running moth traps here, I've had one or two over that time. But in the last two years, I've been getting them regularly in the trap. So it does suggest that either it's going through a major population explosion somewhere, or it is gradually moving inland a little bit. Uh, the winters are mild enough for the caterpillars to, to survive. And what's quite interesting is why are these species able to survive now, whereas they weren't before? What, what is it about some of the ones that seem to be moving inland? And what's interesting is these tend to be um, ones where the life cycle starts in either late autumn or indeed midwinter, that the caterpillars will hatch from the eggs in midwinter or in very early spring. So it's these species that appear to be taking advantage mostly of this uh, slightly warming climate and, and therefore are able to start their life cycles um, uh, you know, in, inland where previously I think the frost and ice and perhaps snow um, would have prevented it because now we just we just don't get any snow down here in Weymouth. I mean, I can't remember the last time I saw snow in the garden that was deeper than a centimeter. You know, it's been it's a it's an absolute rarity here. And yes, we get frosts and we get some pretty hard frosts, but but not in comparison to where you are mostly. Um, so it's uh, these species are taking advantage in in their life cycle for those that uh, do feed on grasses in particular over winter. Right, um, what else have we got? Bill, one of the attendees is just asking if you can give us a sense of scale by telling us what size the hole is that we can see in the screen. Oh, There's a, maybe give us a sense That's of a very good point. That. Okay, yeah. that, that size of hole is a hole punch. So this is, this is the, the back of um, a pad of paper. And so the little hole up here is, is, is the size of a, of a hole punch. So well, we're talking about five millimetres. So, um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, good point. Um, um, so let's look at, um, in fact, why don't I move, get me a hole punch to there, and then you can see perhaps it's given you a, a, some idea of scale. Uh, let's move that up here. So here's lime spec pug moth. Now, lime spec pug is a common species of moth. It's um, lime spec as in uh, bird poo, bird lime. And, and that's why it's called line spec, because it looks like um, bird poo. Uh, in this time of the year, this is a species that I would normally associate with being not strictly one generation a year, but almost certainly one generation a year. And the caterpillars are regularly found at this time of year on, on composite flowers, uh, goldenrod, on sea aster, 
uh, but also a range of other autumn autumn flowering and seeding uh, species, um, including um, uh, burnet saxifrage and uh, great saxifrage. So a range of range of things. But interestingly, this has just popped out another another generation. We've seen a few of those recently. So that's another one of these um, uh, changes into to as a result of a warming climate is that species are more regularly um, doing a, a second generation and that those second generations of moths, the, the, the northern limit of that is moving north. And, um, uh, and so we're tending to find just occasionally in the autumn some of these species, which I think would have been almost obligatory one generation a year and now doing two. Anyway, nice to see a line spec pug. Um, what else? Oh yeah, oh yeah, a bit of fun. Forgotten about this. Um, uh, just a, a few days ago, so here's one I prepared earlier. Um, uh, here's the um, olive pearl moth, which uh, I don't know, it's yeah, a bit difficult. Let me just see if I can get this one to sit in a slightly better way because it's quite difficult on a white background to see. Let's try it on a dark background. No, too bright. Um, so olive pearl moth. Olive pearl, not yet a resident in this country, but I bet it will be soon. So this is a species that was a very rare migrant moth, but has become regular now. And uh, uh, even, even in the middle of the summer, which we would never have seen 20 years ago, this moth is around. So my guess is it's breeding on the North French coast, um, uh, on ash and lilac, Jasmine, it uh, likes um, summer flower jasmine leaves, and um, and also garden privet. You know the, the the hedges of garden privet, and um, this species is now a reg fairly regular in my in my garden trap, but normally associated with southerly winds. And you can see here this is this is a male, and it's trying to find a little bit of moisture um, to feed on. Um, but a beautiful moth, so quite like the mother of pearl, which is obviously widespread. And, uh, but, but these, uh, these pearly white wings with a very similar pearl pearlescence to them. Uh, if we had some, then, then we might be able to catch that pearlescence off the wings. But nice to see olive pearl. Right, and um, just occasionally on a decent night, um, it's what, you know, you get good things. Sometimes it's, I always think it's worth putting the moth trap out whatever the weather if it's mild enough and last night we were chucking it down with rain but you just never know do you? you just never know what you're going to find and and i have to say it was a bit pleased this morning when this this not we special moth turned up so uh there we go we've got whoa flapping around we have a clifton non pari um but he has seen better days so, um, so th this is, and you can see the chunks taken out of the back of the hind wings here. Almost certainly, I would think it's a bat that's doing that myself. It's probably, in this part of the world, likely to be greater horseshoe, because this is an enormous moth, and there's got to be a prize for a greater horseshoe bat that are, that are uh, zubbing around at this time of the year, uh, dispersing quite widely in Dorset. Um, uh, to, to, I don't know whether that's about mating, but but um, quite often find great chunks taken out of the back end of a, of a, a Clifton non pari. So Clifton non pari is now properly resident throughout most of southern Britain, uh, certainly up into South Wales um, and, and up the east coast. So um, uh, in fact, we're about to get in the next few days, uh, winds from, uh, oh, deep from Kakstan. And they're kind of coming up into Northeast England and into Eastern Scotland. Um, it's quite possible that Clifton non pari from Central Europe and Central and Southern Europe will be brought up on those winds. And there are some records now of Clifton non pari from Scotland. So um, don't think it's something that you won't see in your, in your traps and do keep the traps going. You just never know what's going to turn up. Anyway, here's a monster moth for us to see this morning. I'm delighted when I saw that turning over the egg box. Um, so a splendid beast. It's my second this year. I had one last year, one the year before, and never before that. Um, and this species is now, I think there's, a, there's a, one of our recorders north of Dorchester 
he's recording 40 to 50 of these every year. Um, so it's a, it's a remarkable change round in the last 10 years for a species that was just almost absent from this country other than as a migrant, but now fully resident here. And um, people are finding larvae. And they're finding larvae on aspen, and not necessarily in the tall trees, um, on, on uh, sort of two, three inch diameter stems. And when they go to cut them down, they just see this enormous caterpillar, gray caterpillar, sitting on the, on the branch wood. Anyway, what a fantastic beast to see. Thanks, Phil. Uh, over to Tom. Yeah, thank you, Phil, for uh, bailing me out as usual. Uh, my uh, yeah, total incompetence with uh, technology. Um, also, yes, uh, you did get the chance to steal my thunder. Um, I don't quite know how I uh, follow uh, Clifton Nonpareil. Um, but uh, I've been running my trap virtually all week at home in King Usi and caught three moths. Um, I'm now actually down in the borders just outside Melrose uh, because I'm due to a wedding straight after this. And uh, I ran two traps last night, one in Granny's garden and one the other side of Melrose in my brother-in-law's garden. And I got uh, half, a, well, 12 species. Uh, sadly, nothing too exciting. But uh, we have here a yellow-lined Quaker, which is a common species that's out in the, in the early autumn. Um, a, a lovely sort of yellowy golden color. And near the edge of the wing, if you see that, uh, that line, that straight line, that's what gives it its name. Although that does look a very sort of reddish color line. But if you look carefully on the live moth, you'll see that just inside that line is a, is a yellower line. So it can be confused with the brick, uh, which is also out at this time of year, although I didn't catch one. Um, and that line is much more wiggly. Um, but obviously when they're worn, uh, they can be very difficult to, to tell apart. So that's the uh, yellow lined Quaker. Uh, this is a green brindled crescent, uh, a, a wonderful moth, really well camouflaged um, on, a, you know, on a dark log. Um, it's not really seeing its sort of true colours here, but another widespread species that you get uh, at this time of, of year. Um, probably my highlight was this. This is a, a, a copper underwing. Um, I rarely see this in uh, where I am in, or I don't see it where I am in, in King Usi. Um, I've only seen one or two before. There's two very, very similar species. Uh, the copper underwing and the Svensson's copper underwing. And this one's quite worn, so I'm not 100% sure which of the two it is, but uh, I think, although I'm be, uh, happy to be corrected, that this is actually a Svensson's uh, copper, copper underwing. Um, so uh, yes, quite an unusual species uh, for me to catch. Certainly the, the best moth that I caught in terms of its bonniness is this a wonderful, wonderful uh, feathered thorn? Um, really, really fresh, uh, wonderful color. This gorgeous, uh, um, yeah, really, really golden color with the two little white uh, dots near the corner of the wing. Um, I'm not going to disturb this, but if I did, it's got wonderful feathery antennae. Um, a really, really gorgeous autumnal moth, and of course, the the same color as the, as a lot of autumn leaves at the moment. So um, yeah, a, a wonderful uh, common moth, but a lovely, lovely thing to see. Um, Phil showed a Blair's shoulders knot, and uh, I caught one here as well in Granny's garden. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of Leylandii and other exotic conifers planted in people's gardens around here, and presumably that's where it's, uh, it's come from. Um, so a Blair's shoulders knot that is uh, certainly in, the, in Scotland is up to the central belt, uh, it's in the borders and there's a few other strays further north than that. Now at this time of year the, the one set of moths that you do get that become awkward to identify are these. Now this is one of the Eparitas, this is one of the autumnal moths. Um, sadly it's not behaving itself very well but I believe that this is a November moth. Um, the other common one we get at the, the moment or we'll get out we'll get very shortly is autumnal moth. Um, so uh, the name of it suggests that it's a month early, 
um, but uh, they do come out in October. So I think in Scotland, we should perhaps be calling it a uh, October moth. So I think that's it from me to uh, keep us back on track to start. Thank you very much, Phil, for uh, saving the day again and apologies for my uh, incompetence with technology. Hopefully you might uh, hear my talk later. Thank you. Thanks, Phil and Tom, for that moth masterclass. That was fantastic. Um, so our next speaker, uh, we're bang on time as well, which is great. Our next speaker is Dr. Cathy Baird, who is an East Scotland branch committee member and moth enthusiast. And normally Cathy uh, gives us a talk at this time of year about hibernating herald moths and encourage us to, uh, encourages us to go crawling through caves and culverts looking for them. But today she's gonna to be telling us about a fascinating project where she's been trapping in the footsteps of an Edwardian mother. Okay, hello everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about a project that I was working on last year and unfortunately it's all been put on hold a bit this year. Um, I've called it here Rediscovering Alice Balfour's Moths. And Alice Balfour was a lady who lived in East Lothian about a hundred years ago and she recorded moths here. And her moths and her notebooks are now um, kept at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh in the collections there. And I've been able to go and look at them, see what she caught, where she caught it, and then go to these places with my own traps and see what I can find and how that might compare. And it's been really interesting, not only to think how the moths themselves might have changed in the last hundred years, but also how our way of um, recording them has changed. So this is Alice Balfour. This is the only photograph that I know of as an adult that, that, that exists of her. She was born in 1850, died in 19. 36. And she was from a wealthy family. This is her house. This is where she was born and, and lived most of her life. Um, Whittingham House. And just to give you an idea of, of the sort of habitat around. So the house is right in the middle of the screen here. And you can see the surrounding habitat is farmland and woodland mostly. And um, this, if you look at old maps from, from the same period, this is much the same habitat use that it was in Alice's day. But of course, how we manage our farmland, how we manage our woodland has changed um, quite a lot and, and probably will have impacted the moths that we find. Um, Alice was one of eight children, so here they all are gathered around their mother, probably having a daily dose of the Bible. Alice was the youngest daughter and she's the rather serious girl sitting next to her mum's shoulder there. Um, all of her, her siblings, or well, most of her siblings went on to do uh, to lead quite sort of high profile lives, perhaps most um, famously Arthur Balfour, the eldest son, he's the uh, boy sitting with his back to us here, sitting on the ground. Um, he was prime minister, he had a political career and became prime minister for a few years as well and um, is of Balfour declaration fame. So Arthur, as the eldest son, inherited the estate um, when his parents died and he never married and um, Alice also never married, and she came to look after the estate on behalf of her brother, manage his affairs, support his political career. Um, it wasn't something that she had to do, she was of independent financial means, but for whatever reason she did, and um, she spent, um, well, her and Arthur spent all their adult life together, um, and she took her role very seriously, and. It, it took a lot of her time. So I think during quite a big chunk of her adult life, she didn't have um, as much time for moth recording. However, if we look at her collection, we can see that she collected for at least 69 years. So there's two specimens here. This is the, um, the oldest one I found is from 1866. Um, so she was 16 year old, years old, this is a fan foot. And then right through to when she was 85 years old. So this is just a year before she died there's a um, small purple barred moth from June 8, 1935. She also recorded lots of moths that haven't been seen since in East Lothian, lots of species. I think something like 10 or 11 species that haven't been seen since. Um, and just two examples here, we've got a V moth, um, which she found quite regularly. Uh, it's a moth that's seen a massive, massive decline across the whole UK. Um, uh, not one that's likely to be um, encountered in East Lothian now, although you never know, of course. Um, next up we've got a Portland moth, which is a moth I would love to find and we have tried to find it in East Lothian, 
she had this in her garden. Um, it is found in, in certain areas of Scotland, but again, not a common moth. And it wasn't actually um, common in Alice's time. She was pretty excited to find this um, herself. Her moth collection, um, I've, I've got a reasonable sort of idea of the macro moths. I haven't really had a chance to, to get a handle on her micros. It was something that I was going to do this year. Um, but she's got something like 4,400 macro moth specimens in the collections, and there's even more micros. So I suspect um, altogether perhaps um, 10,000 specimens in, in the collections. And this is a reasonable sized number. Um, especially when you consider that they're all from East Lothian. So although she spent time in London, she spent time in other parts of the UK and abroad, there's no evidence that she ever did any moth recording or collecting anywhere other than East Lothian. And she seems to be really focused on this county and really she was a great asker of questions. She wanted to know what was in the county, how it might be different from elsewhere, why we have the moths we did, do, um, why they might be changing. And she brought all of her, um, this is just a lovely picture of um, East Lothian with Bass Rock. Um, she brought all her, um, her own observations together as well as those of some of her contemporaries and people who'd gone before her and, and wrote this paper, Butterflies and Moths Found in East Lothian, mm -hmm. which was published at the end of, um, I think it's 1929. And it's a, basically a list of um, moth species, but it's quite an interesting introduction. I just sort of show you a clip from this. Uh, a quote, she says, no doubt cultivation and unfortunately golf have exterminated many species. Climate seems also to have had affected the range of some, but this is somewhat puzzling and requires more investigation. So here she is wondering why some of um, East Lothian species are perhaps declining. And she's come up with exactly the same things that we are talking about now, farming, golf courses, climate. And um, so, you know, this is a hundred years ago and these ideas were being rooted then. Um, so as well as her notebooks, as well as her specimens, we have her notebooks. And as, uh, this is the sort of selection here. Um, quite interesting, there's some letters um, from a professor in Oxford, which gives you a bit of an insight into some of the scientific thinking of the day, um, various lists. But most interestingly, perhaps, is this Diary of East Lothian Lepidoptera, which she started in 1913. So she was 63 by now, so you, know, you can start late. And this is um, when her sort of main period of moth recording took off really, presumably when her domestic um, responsibilities had um, diminished a bit. And inside this um, diary, we've got lists of specimens, a uh, list of species she saw, so they're not necessarily the specimens that she pinned, these are other observations as well. We've got, um, so we've got the date, how she caught them, numbers, um, comment on the weather, comment on the phenology of plants, um, her sort of thoughts about why something might be common one year and not the next. Um, so lots and lots of extra information that just her pinned specimens alone wouldn't, don't provide. And also, I was quite interested to see some of the sort of, uh, some of her comments that she makes, which give a little bit of an insight into what she was like, and also what moth recording was like 100 years ago. And perhaps unsurprisingly, um, quite a lot hasn't changed. Um, so I'll just uh, share a few, a few snippets with you. Um, this is, um, she was moth recording during World War I. And this is slightly sort of draws parallels with our um, situation this year with COVID and how a sort of government imposed restrictions um, can interfere with your normal moth trapping. So she writes, the territorials are on guard with trenches, etc., all around the coast, and no night muffing was possible. And the hollow north of Ravensview, which is about the best place near the sea, was continually trampled over by them. So she's pretty indignant. Um, there's other um, mentions of um, sugar being rationed, so she couldn't go sugaring like she wanted to, and curfew on lights at night, so she couldn't go out as much as she wanted to. Um, however, if you do look at her records from this period of time, she was still quite productive. So I think maybe there's a lesson that it, it, you know, things aren't always as bad as they seem um, in retrospect. Just a few more of her sort of moans about things getting in the way, um, which are exactly the same for me at least. So there's quite a lot of complaining about the weather. Um, a bad year in some ways. The weather was usually unsuitable when there was no moon and vice versa. 
and you get a bit of an impression that she's just kind of looking for excuses here when things don't go right and well I do that I have to say sometimes um, visitors this is actually a clip from not from her, her diary but from another um, uh, sort of, um, document the weather has been beautifully fine and sunny and we had a good many warm evenings but one can't have one's guests and go off mothing well um, they're very true so sometimes you have to um, tow the family line or whatever when you'd rather be out looking for moths and finally um, no moths so so often with uh, certainly with pinned collections in museums um, with social media nowadays you only get to see people's sort of best catches and you get a very biased view of, of what people are finding in some ways because you don't get to hear about all their failed missions and the things that they didn't get so Alice is quite good at um, picking out these and she says on October the 12th went up to the Lammermuirs in the hopes of finding various micros but did not see a moth of any kind. Free sugar to, on night of 16th, I can't read that, um, not one moth at sugar. And finally El Litterana, one after hibernation on trunk of oak, boxed but escaped just as lid was being put on. So all these um, experiences of hers um, pretty similar to mine today and probably to many moth recorders. <clears throat> so we've got her notebooks which um, and other documents which provide a much sort of fuller picture of the moths she was finding um, and then along with her pin specimens which we can then verify her records from those um, we've got um, lots of information there and so you know this is a good starting point for me to go back to these places and see what I can find and um, before I talk about her moths I just want to have a quick thought about um, any differences in methods between how she looked for her moths and how I looked for mine. So this is Alice's very own um, net, which is in the in her part of her collection in the museum. I'm hoping that they'll let me flourish it maybe sometime, um, but I'm sure she took this um, everywhere she went really. Uh, I haven't got a picture of her, but this is um, Margaret Fontaine, who is a butterfly collector of a similar era. Um, and I just quite like this picture because I can imagine Alice Belfer looking like this as she wandered around her estate trying to find butterflies and moths. Um, I have a net too, so this is very much a method that is still in use now. I'm not very accurate at catching things, unfortunately. Um, beating. So Alice did a lot of beating of shrubs and things for her, her moths, for caterpillars, um, micromoths, geometrids in particular. And seems to have been quite successful. Um, I don't know what kit she used, probably not this funny modified umbrella thing, um, but this is the only picture I could find of the sort of um, old fashioned methods. However, um, umbrellas are still in use by entomologists today. So I've got a white umbrella which I do use more for spiders than moths, I have to say. So I don't actually, beating bushes isn't, isn't a way I would normally go and look for moths. It's quite destructive, if nothing else. Um, finding moth larval stages. Well, we've heard um, a lot of information about this today, um, and Alice and her contemporaries would have would have been very good at, at looking for larval stages and finding them. Not only because um, this was sometimes the best way to find species, but also if you want a beautiful um, specimen for your collection, if you breed them, um, rear them, then you get a freshly emerged adult, which it would be more desirable. So I'm trying ever harder to, to do more of the caterpillar hunting for exactly the reasons that um, Phil was talking about earlier. You know, it, it gives you a fascinating insight into um, the lives of the moth and you get so much more than just seeing a moth in a moth cup. Um, just so you know, this, uh, the eggs are herald eggs. The middle caterpillar is a toad flax pug, which is a new one for me this year. And then the pug emerging from its pupa there is a pimpernel pug. So, um, great fun I recommend caterpillars and, and rearing to everybody um, but I do think generally compared to Alice's time generally now we're probably not as good at, at the sort of field work skills that are perhaps needed um, to be successful. Sugaring so Alice um, certainly used sugar uh, when it wasn't being rationed um, I go sugaring as well occasionally not as much as I'd like a uh, really fun way to find moths but can be a bit unreliable and finally light well light is obviously a, a good way to attract your moths um, you can go 
out after dark with a torch. You can see what you can find. And certainly Alice did this. Um, I can imagine her with a, a lantern in her earlier days, wandering her through her estate woodlands. Um, she did have an electric torch in her later days, which is probably state-of-the-art technology as, as, as that was being developed. Um, and we've got records of her finding moths at lit windows. Um, there's a rather nice account of her, um, her chauffeur driving the Rolls Royce down the country lanes and she's um, catching uh, probably winter moths or November moths in the headlights. So probably not an experience that I'm going to have. Um, and light traps. So nowadays, light traps is, is what most moth recorders use for most of their moths. Um, this is one of my traps on the coast in East Lothian. Alice did have a moth trap, certainly in her diary from 1913 um, onwards, she was using a moth trap. Um, I'm not quite sure what the exact design was, but looking back at other um, sort of papers from the time and things, she will have had a box with a bulb and the moths will, will have been attracted and fall into the box and find it hard to get out. But there are differences. So, um, perhaps the biggest difference now is our bulbs, bulb technology now. The bulbs are much brighter um, and they emit more UV radiation, which we now know is, is particularly effective at attracting moths. So Alice was, she always had her moth trap at her house, Whittingham House, so I suspect it was plugged into mains electricity, but her bulb would have been some sort of incandescent type bulb probably. Um, another difference is in the portability of traps. So nowadays we've got plastic, which is very lightweight and waterproof. We've got batteries, which are relatively lightweight and can power a bulb for a night. Um, so we can much more easily take our traps wherever we want, wherever we can be bothered to heft them. Um, and Alice didn't have this luxury. So her uh, light trapping was very much confined to her house. And we can leave our traps out all night now, re reasonably safely, reasonably confidently. Um, again, Alice, all her light trap records seem to stop at about 1 a.m. So I suspect she didn't want to leave her, her trap running all night. Um, so she might have missed some of the species that fly in the early hours of the morning or be less likely to encounter them. Um, so there are differences in, in our ways of, of catching moths, but the, the range of methods available haven't changed at all really. Um, uh, these differences might, might affect the species that we encounter or how easily we, we find certain species um, and will certainly alter our impression of abundance of some. Um, one other thing that is different is in the number of records generated. So this is for a page from Alice's notebook here and a the screenshot of my spreadsheet, which is far less beautiful. Um, but, um, and, and this graph shows a sort of average records in a year from different methods. So the yellow is light trap records and the blue is all other records. Um, and the red you can't see because both neither Alice nor I, nor I did very much sugar thing. So this is number of records, not, not number of moths. So it's like a line in a spreadsheet. And there's a few things to note here. One is that I'm generating far more records than Alice did in a typical year. And this is partly because I use a lot of light traps. Alice had one light trap, I've got several and, and they generate more records. Um, but also because we've got our spreadsheets, because we've got databases, we've got a national moth recording scheme where we can submit our records. So there's a great motivation to record everything, write it down, send it on, and the information can be used by everyone. Whereas Alice was very much recording for herself um, in her notebook laboratory by hand. And so I suspect that um, there's a lot of things she saw that she didn't note down. So I'm underestimating her records. Um, the other thing to note is that the proportion, Alice only has about a third of her records by light trap. Whereas for me, it's a huge proportion. It's something like 97%. So, um, um, and, and I think that's probably typical of most modern moth trappers, most of our records are um, from a light trap. I just quickly, I'm not going to go into any depth about this, but just show you that there are exceptions to every rule. And for those of you that know um, Roy Everton, he shared his data with me for 2018. 
and you can see what a huge amount of sugar trapping he does and what a huge effort he puts into finding moths not with a light trap. Um, so there are exceptions and, and people who are looking for larvae a lot, might, people who are particularly interested in micromoths, you know, there'll be less reliance on light traps for those methods. So looking at some moths, um, I'm just going to talk about macromoths and I'm just going to look at the sort of area around Whittingham. So although Alice um, recorded all over East Lothian and, and had her favourite spots, I'm just going to focus on Whittingham here. And between her and me, we now have a macro moth total of 269. So in 2019, I recorded 162 macro moths on the estate. Um, mostly that was light traps, and that was about eight, eight sessions, I think, eight nights. Alice in her life has 226 macro moths from the estate. She's very quick to point out that the, she must have missed those because she was always having to be down in London at the best time of year. Um, but it's not a bad tally I don't think. So looking in more sort of depth um, at these numbers, if we look at the ones that I found that weren't around in Alice's time, so you often see these referred to as winners, which I'm not sure whether I like that term or not, but anyway, these are species that are here now and they weren't um, recorded by Alice. So we have a few like canary shouldered thorn, which may have been actually may have been around in Alice's day. It was around in South Scotland a hundred years ago, according to other records. Um, but she didn't get to see it, which is a shame really. Um, it's very much a species that uh, is attracted to light traps, um, flies quite late in the night in the early hours of the morning. So perhaps her records, her methods made it much less likely that she would encounter it. Of course, it may not have been as abundant either. And then lots of the so-called winners are like this clouded silver below. Um, which is a species that's just seen a, a big northwards expansion um, in the last hundred years. So it just wouldn't have been around in this part of Scotland in Alice's time. And there's, there's quite a lot of species that we're getting that are moving, moving up. So then we have the losers. So these are ones that Alice saw uh, recorded herself, but I didn't find in my um, year of looking. Um, species like the Brussels lace. I would love to see a Brussels lace. Um, she recorded them as moderately common around the estate. She's got quite a lot of records, um, but I haven't seen one ever. They are found in neighbouring vice counties. They are sort of reasonably um, you know, around it in the area. Um, so maybe I just need to look a bit harder. Um, it's a, a very localised moth, I think. Um, but if you look at the recent moth atlas, it's doing quite well in, in the UK, so it's on, on the increase overall. Um, so maybe something's happened to the habitat. I think it, it's caterpillar is one of the likely, so it's um, not quite sure what's going on there. Um, there's also species like the buff tips here below that I didn't find um, last year at the estate, but I suspect it is around. It's a reasonably widespread moth in East Lothian, reasonably common. Um, probably um, Alice doesn't have many records, so maybe it's even increased up here. But obviously, if I carried on trapping at Whittingham, I would um, start to find more species. And, and some of the ones that um, Alice saw, I, I, would, I would be able to find as well. It just, you can't find everything in one year. And then we've got um, moths which haven't changed in abundance, well, moths that haven't changed, no change. So they were around in Alice's day and I found them as well. Um, so we've got two feathered thorn here, which is the moth, the lovely moth that Tom finished off on just now. Two different colour varieties. I think this, this yellow one is, is even more beautiful. Um, anyway, a lovely moth that's around now. So Alice found this and, and it was uh, found plenty of them last this time last year. And another uh, lovely moth of the season, the Mervé de Jour. Um, Alice had them and I, I found them too. Um, so that's good that they're still there, but we can't really say whether they're doing well. Have they increased? Have they um, gone down in number? Are they just the same? It, that's a really hard um, uh, thing to, to know. So we, we can map distributions and change in distribution quite easily, but monitoring change in abundance is much harder. And looking at Alice's um, comments about Mervé de Jour, um, she says um, that she found them resting on trunks by day. 
um, which gives the impression that they were perhaps quite common. And I've tried looking for Mervé du jour resting by trunks on day several times, even more so when I've, since I've read her comments. And no luck at all. In fact, um, I'm not finding them in this way, or am I just rubbish at looking? Um, my light traps actually caught more Mervé du jour than Alice ever saw in her life, and that was just from one night's worth of trapping. So does that mean that they're more common now? And you see, it's really hard to, to compare with different methods and, and different conditions. So I just want to spend a bit of time, well, I'm just going to talk about two different um, species of moth. The emperor moth, um, really widespread moth in East Lothian now, in the Lammermere Hills, and it was around in Alice's day. Beautiful moth, this is a male and they fly around by day very fast. Um, Alice has got quite a lot in her collection, all from the Lammermuir Hills, and a lot of them are bred, so she would have gone and looked for caterpillars and bred them. Um, nowadays, I oh know, hang on. Um, so she found them in the Lammermuirs as well, but the area that she recorded them mostly was from a place called Whitewell um, and White Castle Hill Fort. And it, um, this part of, of the hills was somewhere where there weren't any so I thought that would be a good place to go and see if they were still there and here's a picture of a slightly sheep trashed um, bit of the Lama Muse. Um, of course the these days is to use a um, pheromone lure. I just thought can everyone still hear me? Can you all still hear me? Yeah? So I'm in com I've got uh, internet messages coming up. I'm in competition for internet use here. Um, so the way we look now is with a pheromone lure. And so that's what I did. I took my pheromone lure, which you can buy very cheaply, up into the hills at White Castle Hill Fort. And um, almost immediately, I had two male emperors visit me. So this was really good, really nice to know that um, the moth is still in the same place that Alice found it 100 years ago but um, I did feel a bit cheated as to how easy it was. Um, Alice, I thought, and I thought, you know, would Alice have been um, amazed at this, this modern way of finding moths? Uh, well, probably not. If we look in her notes, there's a, a page from a, a Watkins and Doncaster or similar catalogue where you can buy pupa. I have no idea what all this shillings is in, old, in new money, but she's crossed some. Um, so we've got poplar hawk moth, we've got Kentish glory, large selected females, um, iron prominent, Luna mamba brown, lots of lovely moths there. And she says those marked with an X might be useful for assembling males. And this is a technique that was used back then where you get a newly emerged female, take her to suitable habitat, let her release her pheromones naturally and hopefully attract a male. So it's certainly um, something that a uh, uh, concept that Alice was aware of. There's no evidence that she actually went ahead and did this. And finally, Epiphany said I wouldn't mention heralds, but I am. A quick plug for the Hibernating Herald project. Um, Alice has some heralds in her collection. She's got seven and she says it's a rare moth. So I was really interested to know, you know whether I could find it. Um, she gives a bit more detail about some of the specimens. So she's been finding them at rest or at lights in a house at, at this time of year. And there was one found by a forester on, on trunks. So probably hibernating in a log pile. So this is a moth that's around now, but it's, it's going into hibernation and it will spend the winter as an adult in hibernation. Um, um, so Alice knew that it hibernates. She says hibernates in sheds here, comes to sugar. Um, it doesn't come to light traps very easily, though it will. So I wanted to know whether I could find it and the Hibernating Herald project, which is running in Scotland, if you do a search for Hibernating Heralds, you can find out more about how to take part. Um, it turns out that looking for them at this time of year in hibernation is a very good way of recording them. So I was wondering what dark places I could find on the estate. And there's an old ice house, it's often ice houses on these big old estates, which are worth looking in, and also a, a culvert, a sort of stone light culvert. So I've been keeping an eye on these. 
and sure enough there's heralds in there so that's very exciting and every year i've looked so i was up there earlier this week there's been heralds in both these places and you know i've amassed far more herald records than alice did um, i think earlier this week i counted 20 uh, on the estate so this is obviously a very good way of looking for them um, there's no evidence that alice went seeking hibernating heralds but i'm sure she would have been up for hitching her skirts up and following me into a culvert if she was still alive um, but it just goes to show again that methods matter and you can't really compare and so just to finish up what has all my sort of efforts um, me in terms of updating our records you now I've been able to look in detail more detail about what Alice found um, and and learn more about the moths that were around 100 years ago and, and we can use this information to add to our existing records. So I've been able to strike some moths off her list so she claimed toad flax pug, lead coloured pug, thyme pug, um, some of which would have been really rather lovely. Um, I have to acknowledge it with the Roy's out there in the ether but I have to acknowledge Roy Leverton for an enormous amount of help in, in helping identify these pugs. I can't identify living pugs let alone pinned ones. So this picture here is what she thought was a lead coloured pug and in fact to give her credit she didn't she didn't know what it was she sent it off to the geometric expert of the day down in London which is the way you got your moths identified in those days um, and he misidentified it so there's a lesson there don't always listen to experts. Um, there's some moths that were on her list uh, that weren't on her list which was quite surprising brown silver lines golden rod pug well it turns out she did find them they've just been misidentified and filed in the wrong part of the um, moth collection in the museum there's some species that are, we can add to the county list so small purple bar brussels lace striped hawk moth and by being able to look at her specimens these can be verified um, so particularly something like a Brussels lace, which I mean, these look very much like Brussels lace, but you could imagine she, maybe she confused them for something else. Um, we can check this. And finally, um, perhaps more sort of um, usefully are all the common moths and the more ordinary sightings that she made. Um, and uh, this map shows the places she recorded from. So you can see she was quite, quite, you know, went to quite a lot of places in East Lothian. And by um, extracting records from her notebooks and her specimens, um, I've been able to add new dates and new locations to some of our sort of um, for many species in East Lothian. Um, there's 101 new dots on the map. And so far, and it's an ongoing job, there's been 2,500 records, nearly, well, fairly nearly 6,000 moths and 285 species. Um, I've been to a spreadsheet which is now going to the National Moth Recording Scheme. So it's a huge additional amount of um, information that can contribute to our understanding of moths um, today and, and how they might change. And of course there's plenty more to do. So I don't know how many of you have been up to the museum collections at Granton in Edinburgh but it's definitely worth a visit once they open up again. It won't be until next year now. Um, and there's lots of drawers with moths all nicely pinned out and quite a few of these have been, the data from these have been extracted and some are on the National Moth Recording Scheme. But there's also all these cardboard boxes at the back um, and nobody really knows what's in a lot of these. So probably no huge surprises, but an awful lot of moths of the sort of perhaps more ordinary species, just with data waiting to be extracted for anyone who's got um, time, needs lots of time and inclination. And so I just want to thank Ashley at the Museum, or well, the National Museums of Scotland, and Ashley, who's the assistant entomologist there, she's enormous help and very enthusiastic. Michael Brander, who's the estate owner now, who's been um, very supportive and interested in the project. And Roy, as I mentioned earlier, huge help identifying all sorts of specimens. And Mark has done a lot of help with them um, getting everything onto the National Moth Recording Scheme and error checking for me, which has been a huge help too. Thank you. Uh, that was really interesting. Lots of people in the comments are saying how <laughs> fascinating that was. A really good, good talk. Uh, great to shine a light on Alice. She was obviously a very intelligent and observant um, ecologist and it really highlights how important museum specimens are and I would definitely uh, 
echo the comment you made about visiting the collections. They're there to be enjoyed and used and um, yeah, they're fascinating. I've got time for one very quick question. Um, Rory says, with declining numbers of moths, what are your thoughts on collecting and pinning for personal collections? Is it morally acceptable? Ooh, I'm not sure I can answer that one quickly. That's a controversial <laughs> question. Um, it depends on what your moral standpoint is. Um, personally, I don't do any collecting. I think for your own personal use, if you're um, being sensitive about it, then uh, a pin collection won't damage the population of, of, of moths. There's no evidence that collecting um, it damages um, populations and for some for some moths you need to um, at least kill them to identify them and you know, I've got a bit of a background in spiders you need to kill those to identify them. So there's a lot of um, invertebrates that just have you, you can't you don't know what you've got unless you kill them and, and there's been a lot of um, study to that shows that this doesn't cause any damage to the populations. So I don't, I don't think generally, I'm generalizing here, but I don't think for, for most species that collecting, as long as you don't do very much and not everyone's doing it will, will cause um, problems. In, in some ways, the fact that nobody or very few people do collect now, um, that is potentially in the future is going to be a big gap in, in our knowledge. We've got photographs, um, but they only show so much um, and so I think possibly we may wish, looking back, we may go back and wish that actually this period of time now, probably the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years where collecting has gone massively down for butterflies and moths, perhaps we will wish that actually some, um, um, you know, some specimens or some more specimens were in existence because there's a lot of things you can do with a specimen. Um, not just see it in 3D, but you can extract DNA and all, all of that. Um, yeah, definitely. So that's a very sort of poor answer, really. But it's a big, big topic. And I think there's be lots of different points of view. And I don't want to be controversial on record. Okay. Thank you very much, Cathy. That was a great talk. Hello, my name is Ashley Walker, and I'm currently in my final year of study for animal science at Canterbury Christchurch University. As it's my final year of university, I'm required to form an independent study. So with thanks to this, I bring you Uncovering the Secrets of the Silver Shade Moth. Okay, so before we get too deep into this, I'd just like to explain a bit about the moth, its background, its history, and most importantly, its distribution throughout the UK. The Silver Shade is a micro moth with a wingspan around 20 to 30 millimetres, which makes them pretty hard to find when you're walking up and down the mountain sides. So the moth is primarily found throughout Europe and North America. But even here in the UK, we do have a tiny region where you can find them. So the UK range at the moment is a bit of a controversial topic in the world of silver shade, with some sources stating they're found in one small spot of Glen Till, while others state they're distributed over many miles of Glen Till. Regardless of which one of the sources is correct, this distribution still seemed very odd for me. So this is kind of what led to the basis of my project. The fact that in the whole of the UK, this is the only place you can find the moth is just really odd. So this kind of led to the question, why is the moth only found here? This in itself is a really complex question with loads of factors that will play a part in it. So I effectively had to narrow down all the factors there were and pick which one I was most interested to study. My final decision was the relationship between the moth and its local vegetation. With this question in mind, I began prepping for the next three weeks ahead of me. This mainly involved buying a lot of tinned food and some camping equipment. As I'm a poor student, I thought the best course of action would be to live in a tent for the next three weeks. I must say I regret this very quickly after meeting the local midges. So after about a week of prepping, the 16th of July came and I left Canterbury with high hopes and a car full of baked beans. As you can see from my little map at the bottom right of the screen, the drive took me around nine and a half hours, excluding all my breaks for Mackey's. I think this may have been the numbest legs I've had in my whole life, but thankfully I had a nice hotel room waiting for me for the first night. The main picture for this slide was taken in Pit Lockery where my hotel was located. So this area is around the fish ladder there, and I must say it completely blew my mind. This is my first time visiting Scotland, so I haven't really seen anything like this before, and just seeing it in person was breathtaking. Unfortunately, the fish ladder itself was closed, but just seeing the scenery alone was enough for me. It was also here that I met my first few Scottish people, and I must say I was incredibly surprised at how friendly all of you are. I'm used to all the cold southerners who barely even look at each other, 
So to have this friendly conversation with complete strangers was really refreshing to me. The next morning I headed over to Roslyn to collect some moth traps that the Forest Research Centre very kindly lent to me. Now that I had this final piece of kit, I was ready to do my study, so I headed back to the Glentill car park. It was in the next two hours of my life that I discovered the true meaning of suffering. To get to the camp and then back to my car, I had to cycle a total of 16.8 miles. This was a bit of a nightmare for me, considering I haven't done a bit of cardio since leaving secondary school. The one thing that kept me going through this hard time in my life was all the beautiful scenery around me. So the four pictures currently on screen were actually taken during little breaks to rest my poor little legs. As you can see, no matter where I stopped, there was always a picture worthy scene. It was such a blessing to be able to cycle through such amazing scenery. I mean, when you have your music on and the sun's beating down on your back, it just gives you a sense of tranquility you don't feel anywhere else. So this little trip probably took me around three and a half hours. I think I could have done it quicker if I didn't have to push my bike up every hill. But thankfully the outcome was a positive one and I decided I would be able to drive my car down to the site. Okay, so from this picture you can see me and my car safely made it to the site. There were a few bumps and scrapes on the way, but nothing too major. I also had my tent set up by this point, but unfortunately I didn't think to move my head out of the way for the picture. So instead you'll just have to imagine it's there right behind me. So after I arrived at the site, I know I had a few days to get to grips with my surrounding before resident expert Tom Prescott was coming down to help me out with my project. As with most new things, I ran into a few hiccups very early on. The first being that my cutlery was absolutely nowhere to be seen. Thankfully I had a shovel on hand, so I instead ate my spaghetti and meatballs off this. I also took this time to become acquainted with the local wildlife. Being in Scotland, I saw some amazing animals in the wild that I've just never seen before, such as red squirrels, voles, oyster catchers, buzzards, and even eagles. I was very lucky in the fact that there was a group of birds of prey which nested just at the top of the site. This just made the experience so much more amazing as I got to see them flying overhead every single day. I also met a fair few of the local leps in the area during this period. Speaking of the local leps, there was also a large population of grass moths which had very similar grey silvery colours on them. In the early days of this project, I was definitely very naive to the whole world of Lepidoptera. So in my mind, every single moth I saw with a bit of grey or a bit of silver was the elusive silver shade. This led to me spending a lot of my time just running up and down the hills constantly for what turned out to be just another grass moth. A prime example of this being C. palella, which got me a good handful of times. Thankfully though, Tom swiftly broke my disillusion once I showed him all the pictures I'd taken of these grass moths and instead pointed me in the right direction. Sunday the 19th finally arrived and with it came my saviour, Tom Prescott. I owe Tom a massive amount of thanks for my project as he not only assisted me with the crucial tasks such as identifying the plants and the moth itself, but he was also a massive help on the logistics side of things such as getting me in contact with the estate rangers and finding me some moth traps to borrow to complete my project. So after a crash course in all the local vegetation from Tom, we began our ascent up the hill face, and with that, the hunt for the silver shade had begun. Our method for finding the moth was effectively zigzagging up and down the hillside, hoping to kick up a cloud of moths and then catching them in our net. We'd been at this for a good few hours, and we still had no results, so I could definitely say that I was starting to lose hope in ever seeing one of the silver shade moths. Although I think this was heavily impacted by the terrible weather conditions and the fact I'd slipped down the hill on my backside a fair few times by this point. But then it happened. Tom called me over with a tube in his hand, and I knew that the hunt was complete. I must say this moth completely destroyed all expectations I had of it. This moth was nothing like the grey grass moth I'd been chasing up and down the mountainside. This moth was a pure silver with a beautiful metallic sheen and some lighting. At the right angle it even came off as a brilliant white colour. Now, with proof that the moth was still present in Glen Tilt, the real work could begin. So now that I knew the moth was present, I could finally begin my study. The method was basically as follows. I'd set my four traps on the hillside at around 8pm each day. I would then record the 10 digit OS coordinates of each trap. The following morning I would then return to each of my traps and record the number of silver shades caught either in or around the traps, if any. A cord trap measuring all the plant species present and their percent coverage of the area was then taken to the site and 20 metres north, east, south and west of the site to get a rough idea of the surrounding area as well as the immediate area. As the moths can travel quite easily, it was important to get the surrounding area included, so we had a rough idea of their whole habitat as opposed to just a tiny slice of it. This setting and collecting of the traps was then repeated for the next three weeks until I left. And here we have the fruits of my labour. The final count on Silvershade's court was 34, meaning I now hold the official record for the most UK Silvershade seen. 
this is now my biggest flex and my go-to piece of trivia about myself. Yeah, so if, as you can see on the map, there are four different types of symbols. The black dots represent a trap with no moths caught, and the three different sizes of red dots indicate the number of moths caught in the trap, with the biggest showing three moths and the smallest being one moth. What I find quite interesting about this map is there seems to be a very definitive range from the red dots. If a box was drawn from all these points, it would clearly form a nice area. And when measured, this area averages out around 200 meters by 200 meters. Unfortunately, you can't see this too well in the satellite images. But in person, you can see definitive borders around this area. An example of this would be the burn, which you can see going straight down the middle of this image. Vertically, there's also two strict borders. At the bottom, we have this line of conifer trees, which the moth doesn't seem to go past at all. And at the top is where the mountain became its steepest, and it was also littered with heather. When you got far enough left, there were no longer rocks on the hillside, so this made up the left border of the moth's range. In hindsight, I wish I had a greater spread of my traps vertically, but despite this, the border is clearly visible and very well defined. So, what's next? First, I'm going to have to run the statistics on all my data. This has taken a while as I currently have 47 rows and 171 columns to put through a spreadsheet. So realistically, I don't think I'm gonna have my results ready till closer to my due date in 2021. With the data I've collected though, there are also many other studies that can be done from the same data set, such as geology studies, topology studies, and many more. In the future, I'd love to see another individual head to the Glen to perform a population study on the moths. I think this would be very interesting as it would give us a rough figure of how many moths actually live at Glen Tilt. But ultimately, I hope enough studies are done on enough topics to definitively answer the question, why is the silver shade moth only found in Glen Tilt? Thank you all for listening. And before I go, I'd just like to give a massive thank you to my lecturer, Joe Berman. Without him, none of this would have happened. He put me into contact with Tom. He got his project underway. So big props to him. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at the address provided at the bottom of this slide. And thanks for listening. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that there is going to be a big focus on volunteer development going forward and Anthony McCluskey, our Helping Hands for Butterflies project officer, is now going to tell us about some winter opportunities you can get involved with. Yeah, so there is plenty to do in the winter, um, but it's also we're in the time of COVID-19 as well. So we want to assure all our volunteers that we're doing everything uh, as much as we can to keep everybody safe when we're out and about doing these um, events at the moment. So Tom recently had a work party at uh, Paul Mealy uh, near Drumlid Rocket near Loch Ness. And, mm -hmm. and as you can see, everybody's keeping social distancing and all the rest. So we're doing our best to keep everybody safe and to stay within the guidelines. Um, I should say for any of the opportunities that you see during this talk, um, if you email the scotland at butterflyconservation.org email address and let us know what you're interested in, then we'll put you in touch with the right person. And I've got that email address just highlighted there and you'll see it in all of my slides. So we can split it up into a few different um, aspects of our work. If you want to create and maintain habitats, there's a huge amount going on this autumn and winter. Um, our staff are running about 30 volunteer work parties just this autumn and winter alone around the whole of almost the whole of Scotland and now with the Species on the Edge project starting next year we should be doing more stuff around the coast as well. So I'll start off with my own project which is the Helping Hands for Butterflies project. This is mostly around creating urban meadows for butterflies and parks across central Scotland and as you can see we're, we were busy last winter but for three years we're going to create and manage these same meadows so that over time they'll be put into a much better condition. So the sites which I'm working on are in Glasgow including Ruckhill Park, Springburn and Elder Parks, then in Edinburgh in the Granton area, Hamilton, Blantyre and Lennox Town. And so if you want to be involved in those, just email and let me know. I'm doing those works over the coming weeks and months. So we're doing things like raking up the um, cuttings um, of the grass cut by the council. We're also planting wildflower plugs and sowing seeds such as yellow rattle. And already some of the results are showing, um, uh, showing some great results. Things like this uh, meadow in Springburn Park, where there was lots of yellow, um, lots of ragged robin this summer, and even wild orchids were returning to the site, which had been managed um, very intensively before. Other things as well, um, Epiphany mentioned earlier, we just received funding this, um, uh, we just received an announcement this week that we received funding for our bog squad for until the end of March, at least next year. This is such important work because our lowland peak bogs have declined by 90% in Scotland, so anything we can do to help them is really vital. Um, some of the work will include um, putting in dams to re-wet the bogs or removing invasive plant species. 
This is also important because it helps species such as the large heath butterfly, but also bogs um, are an incredibly important carbon source, um, or carbon store, and whenever they get damaged, they release that carbon back into the atmosphere. So this work will hopefully help keep that carbon in the ground. There are work parties planned for there from November onwards for Cumbernauld, Stirling, South Lanarkshire and Dumfries. So again, it's got a quite large area to work in. Um, and we've got plenty happening in Highlands as well. And these really, this is your opportunity to help some of the rarest moth and butterfly species in the UK, including the Kentish Glory and Dingy Skipper. So um, some of the work that we know of, um, which will be managed by Tom Prescott, um, will be happening near Loch Ness, near Drum the Drocket, the Aviemore area and in Glenfeshie. So again, if you email the Scotland at address, we can get you in touch with Tom so that you can take part in those. And then in the borders, there will be some work parties to help the Northern Burn Argus. But it's also really important that we record our butterflies and moths and our report, um, our biggest report lately came out in 2015. It was the State of UK Butterflies 2015 report. And I found that three quarters of our butterflies had declined in their range or their abundance over the past 40 years. But how did that report come around? Well, it used uh, 11 million occurrence records as well as data from over 2000 sites where butterflies are monitored annually. But that doesn't happen on its own. It requires people to record them, but also everybody in between to make sure that we get those records. Um, and we have some volunteer opportunities, which you can do from home quite easily. And we would like to have more of these people. So the, we have a network of county butterfly recorders, and these really are a vital link between our local recorders and the National Records Database. They check and verify the records. And this means that we get good quality data reaching the statisticians to analyze the data. So we have a lot of um, vacancies, mostly in Glasgow and Southwest Scotland branch. Um, and as you can see, it's mostly this region, including Ayrshire, Dumfries and Galloway, Renfrewshire and Inverclyde, Arran and Isla and Jura. So if, you're, if you think you might want to do that, let us know. Um, we can give you some training for that and you'll be supported by local branch members who will help you, help you through the early process of it. So definitely please get involved because this is something you can do from home in the winter and it really helps the data get to us in a good condition. Then um, also transect coordinators. These are people who help the um, new people to find local butterfly transects or to help them set them up. Um, and again, this is essential because these transects are where we get the best monitoring data for butterflies. So it helps ensure that Scotland remains represented in the statistics. We can see lots of red dots here in Southern England, um, but almost none in some parts of Northern Scotland. And we would like to, um, we would like to remedy that. And really some of the best people who can help that are volunteer transect coordinators. And certainly this year, I've found that by coordinating more transects, I've been helping more volunteers to get involved in their local transect recording systems. So we have some vacancies for all of Highland, but we might be able to split that up. So if you want to do a certain part of Highland, um, please let us know and we can, um, we can accommodate that. Um, and then in the borders as well, um, and in Ayrshire. So these are some of the places, oh, and also Renfrewshire. These are some of the places where we need some new transect coordinators to help out. But I should say that I'll be running some training workshops to train co transect coordinators over the winter in preparation for next year. So you won't be thrown in at, the, in at the deep end and we'll give you everything you need to start doing this role for us. And then it's really important that you support your local branch as well if possible. And um, one of the branches which has reached out to us at Butterfly Conservation has been the Glasgow and Southwest branch. They really want to recruit new branch committee members from a diverse range of backgrounds no matter what your level of experience. So even if you know almost nothing about butterflies and moths, I know for sure that some of the people on the committee at the moment started because they attended one event and then they got interested and then they became pretty much experts in butterflies and moths. So you can start from a very, um, any kind of basis. You might even want to help us with their, their social media, um, running events, um, or even managing newsletters and, and things like that. So, uh, and also branch admin. So if any of these appeal to you, again, let us know and we can put you in touch with the, the local branch there. Again, yes, you don't need to be an expert in butterflies and moths. Um, and so just to wrap up quickly, I want to say, if you're interested, let us know, you've got the address there and we will pass your details on to whoever um, is most relevant. So uh, hopefully you can all see this. Um, I think this is the third or maybe the fourth time that I've given such a, a talk. Um, people are always keen to know, uh, was it a good year or not for, for butterflies and moths? 
Um, it's obviously the, the season hasn't yet come to an end. People are still delving in their notebooks to collate all their records. So what I've done to uh, produce this talk is that I've emailed the 41 uh, Vice County Moth Recorders that collate all the records from their local patch. Shona has kindly done the same for all the regional butterfly recorders. And then what I what then happened is that I was literally inundated uh, with lots of photographs, lots of news, um, lots of examples of species doing well or not doing well. And then I had the very difficult task of deciding how do I trim all that down into 20 minutes. So um, apologies now at the very start. This is a, a slightly personalized uh, version because I had to choose which ones I included and which ones I didn't. So apologies if you've sent something and thought that it merits uh, inclusion. It probably did, but uh, sorry, it's not in. So um, what was 2020 like uh, with COVID, with people being confined to barracks for a good part of the year? Well, I think as with every year, it was very mixed. Scott Shanks, who is the uh, butterfly recorder for a good part of uh, South uh, West Scotland and, and Argyll and the Central Belt, um, he said so far he's only had 5,000 records, whereas usually uh, he gets, for instance, in 2019, he had 27,000 records. Now, obviously, as I said before, we're only part way through the, the, we're not at the end of the season and a lot of people use the winter months to collect their records. But uh, I think that shows from Scott's point of view that uh, there's fewer, he's had fewer butterfly records. However, uh, Barry Blake, who is the moth recorder for Wester Ross up in the northwest of Scotland, um, in 2019, he had 2,260 records. And already this year, he's had over 4,000 and many, many more to come in. So he's suggesting that even a terrible pandemic like COVID can produce some positive spin-offs. However, his neighbor, Graham Critterton at West Sutherland, um, has had fewer visitors to the area and fewer records. Um, so a mixed picture. And uh, Glenn Roberts of Nesbrek in the, in the east of Scotland, um, he thinks that he certainly had fewer records coming in. Now, I'm always a bit behind the times, um, and this is a record not from 2020, but this is a sighting from 2019. And um, this photograph uh, was on iRecord and Scott Shanks uh, uh, was able to identify it. I must admit, I would struggle to identify it. Um, ooh, I don't know what's happened there. There's the, uh, and here's a better photograph of that same butterfly. So this was seen on the 24th of September. Um, just north of Dalbeatty. And this is what it is, a silver washed fritillary. I think the first record of silver washed fritillary in Scotland. Um, it's late in the year, but it's still within its flight period. It occurs in, Cum in Cumbria, where it has been spreading, but still, but struggling a wee bit. A wee bit. Um, so you can see from this map here, that uh, I don't know, Dalbeatty is somewhere around here. Uh, there's colonies here around the uh, sort of Arn side, around Morecambe Bay. Uh, this map goes up to 2014. My understanding that it has, there have been a few records further north in the Lake District. So um, something to look out for. So this was in tw this was in 2019. I've not received any reports of it in 2020. So something to uh, to something very exciting and something to be aware of. Also equally exciting, in a similar area near uh, Lockerbie, we had reports on the 2nd of June of a pair of marsh fritillaries being seen together at a very remote site uh, just close to Lockerbie. Now our Scottish marsh fritillary colonies are all confined to Argyle, mainland Argyle and the islands, places like Mull and Isla. But there's an introduced population in, uh, in Cumbria, in northern Cumbria. So it's difficult to know whether this particular site, which is about here, has come north from the Cumbrian population that is doing well, or because it was such a remote site, 
And because it was uh, such a very good site, it could well have been there all the time and just gone unnoticed. So something very, very exciting. Marsh fritillary in Dumfries and Galloway. Always nice to see rare butterflies, Camberwell Beauty, only one record that so far has been reported by Elaine Berry in her garden in Inverclyde. So uh, a very exciting uh, um, sighting. And commas, commas are still doing incredibly well in Scotland, still moving north. Um, in the Highlands, they are doing very, very well in places like Nethy Bridge and Granton, uh, with lots of records where they are uh, resident. Um, in Aboyne, the first sighting of a caterpillar to show that they are breeding um, in the east of Scotland. So that's the very first record of a, of a caterpillar being found in the wild in the northeast of Scotland. It's also doing well with multiple records in Glasgow, Lanarkshire, Stirlingshire, uh, new records in Ayr, also in Argyll, records from Tainalt and Bon Orr. So it's a really, really positive story. Uh, one was seen in Muir of Ord uh, about, uh, about a month ago. Uh, so that's one of the very, very few sightings north of the Great Glen. But the prize record is this particular butterfly, this this particular individual that was recorded in Caithness, almost as far north as you could go in, in March. Um, so they really are doing very, very well and uh, continuing to spread. Obviously, if we'd been at Battleby uh, in the lunchtime, um, many people would have gone out and done the, the annual pilgrimage to see the Battleby comma. And there's a map showing you know, where, where it was up until 2014. So it really is spreading uh, very, very well. So a nice positive uh, story. I'm not sure whether I went out then or not. Um, oh, I told you I wasn't very good with uh, technology. Um, I'll carry on. I had a wee message there to say that my screen sharing had uh, paused, but hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm back in the room. Um, wall butterfly, um, a very scarce species in Scotland. Um, it occurs up the east coast up to about Edinburgh. Last year we had the exciting news that one was found at Fauslew and one in Loch Leven. Well, the, the good news has continued. The, uh, the, the butterfly has spread in 2020. And apparently, it is the biggest story in Fife. Uh, 14 records of wall butterfly in Fife. Um, so it really, really has spread. So this is, uh, for those who don't know where Fife is, so it's, it's been seen mostly all, all bar one were around the coast. Um, so hopefully that means that it is colony, colonizing and this spread up the east coast is continuing. Now the big butterfly count, uh, that happens every year for three weeks in the middle of July to the end of August. Um, if you remember last year, it coincided with the enormous invasion of painted ladies, uh, primarily into Scotland, um, although they did occur uh, obviously south of the border as, as well. Now this year uh, in the UK, the uh, participation was up, 25% up on last year, and the number within the number of counts um, in Scotland, uh, we didn't fare quite so well. Now, I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, certainly participation was down and the number of counts was down, as was the number of butterflies. And if you look there, in 2019, there was over 141,000 painted ladies only counted, uh, whereas uh, only just under 27,000 butterflies and moths in total. Now I think sometimes the, the period of big butterfly count doesn't always coincide with our peak butterflies uh, season and also uh, the, the species that you record was quite limited. I know that I went out a couple of times and saw things like Scotch Argus and dark green fritillary and uh, they were not on the official form to report in so maybe that had put a few people off. But the, the winner, the, the species that was most regularly recorded in Scotland was a small tortoiseshell. Um, over 5,000 were, were reported, were recorded, uh, but uh, sadly that is still a decline on last year by 21%. 
Meadow Brown here in the top right uh, was up 100%. That was the fourth highest, uh, that was the, the, the butterfly that was in the fourth position uh, with small white and large white second and third. Uh, Ringlet also did very well with a 94% increase uh, on 2019. And it's arrived also in Caithness and Sutherland, the first records from the, those very two, um, you know, most northern counties uh, in the UK. So it, it's been doing very well. And uh, Common Blue uh, was up by 71% on 2019. Uh, with 861 counted in Scotland uh, during the big butterfly camp. Other species of butterfly um, through the season, which did well. Um, Northern Brown Argus. Uh, David told us all about the perils of Northern Brown Argus in the borders and elsewhere. Um, well, in Fife, again, maybe this should be another uh, top story in Fife, but we have one of our wonderful volunteers, Hamish Johnston, who counts them regularly at a site near King Craig. And he had two, he counted it over the season, 284 individuals. So a very, very strong colony there. And this was twice as many as his previous maximum count. So it's good to know that this rare and threatened butterfly is doing well um, at that particular site. If we go to the top left to speckled wood, again, similar to the comma, this butterfly is doing very, very well in Scotland and spreading into lots of new areas. A lot more records in the central belt in Glasgow, in Eyre, become far more co co common in, in Murray. Um, so another species that is, uh, is doing very well. And the bottom left, the purple hair streak. Um, again, far more records. Uh, Duncan Davidson found a new colony near Okhtamakti. Uh, I can never do these talks without mentioning the wonders that are Tam Stewart. Um, he found an old report of purple hair streak been recorded in the parish of Hamilton in 1845. So that's 170 years ago. Uh, so this was Tam's mission to go and refind it. And of course, off he went, um, found suitable oak trees, and there was still purple hair streak 170 years later. And he also found it in the neighboring um, area of Glasgow. And also in Perth, this photo is from Edith Robertson, who had one just in the outskirts of Perth at North, North Muirton. Last year was certainly the Painted Lady year. Um, this year, certainly in the latter part of the season, I would say has been a Red Admiral year. Lots of records, lots of people having their buddliers dripping with, uh, with Red Admirals. So a, a good year for, for Red Admirals, particularly in the, in the latter part, and lovely, lovely fresh ones. We did a uh, online survey this year and a postcard survey encouraging people to look for small copper. Uh, we're fairly pleased with the results. Um, there were, as you can see there, 271 records came in from 155 recorders and in total 423 uh, small coppers were, were found. The dots on the map on the right that uh, was produced by David Hill and this plots all the, the records that we received. Um, the one area that it does highlight is that these records here on the Western Isles. Until now we have not had any reports of small copper from the Western Isles. So we're trying to track down the person who saw them and to see how genuine they are. Also, some of these dots in Northeast Scotland are in new areas. So if you have seen small copper this year and you haven't reported it to us, then please go online. Here's our website address and you can log your sightings. And then we'll write it up, write up a little report and this gives us a wee snapshot as how this wonderful and beautiful butterfly is doing in the country. Let's go over to the dark side. Let's go over to the moths. Um, there's been a few new species occurring in Scotland. This is one of them. Uh, as I said, I'm in Melrose, based in Melrose today. Uh, this is just down the road in Castleton. Um, it was seen in the spring. So this is a spring species, blossom underwing. And you can see from the map here, 
that uh, it was very close to the border. So maybe that this wasn't a surprise that Blossom Underwing, which is associated with oaks, I know one has now been recorded just nipping across the, across the border. But uh, always very exciting to add a, a new moth to the, to the list, to the Scottish list. This species was probably a bit more unexpected, sharp angled peacock. This was recorded on Butte by Ron Forrester, who with his pal Doogie Menzies um, have been there. Both of them are birders, but I think now we can claim them as moth recorders. Uh, unfortunately, neither of them are here today because they've gone off twitching to the silly isles, but they've actually taken their moth trap. And uh, last year, I'm just looking at my notes. They added six, uh, no, sorry, no, they added 33 new species of moth to the Butte list, um, of which this the Butte lies within the Vice County of, uh, that includes Aaron, and of those six micros and four macros were new to the, uh, to the Aaron and the Clyde Islands Vice County. Now, here's a map showing you the distribution of uh, the sharp angled peacock and Butte, well, there's Aaron, and Butte is just to the north of Aaron here. And it would suggest from this map that rather than the moth coming north through England, as Blossom Underwing has done, this has just nipped over and uh, arrived via Ireland. So I suspect that that's where the sharp angled carpet has come from. Another unexpected find is Blair's Mocha. This is quite a scarce uh, immigrant. Um, it was found, as you see there, by Alistair Forsyth. But where was it seen? You can see here that there's no records at all in the, in the north of England, mostly along the, along the southern coast of England, a few inland ones. And if you look at the flight period here, you can see between 1970 and 79, it was very much a migrant species that just occurred in October. But in the period from 2000 to 2016, it was seen more throughout the year, suggesting that it had become resident. So where was this moth seen in Scotland? Well, it was actually seen in Orkney. So maybe with the Atlas putting Orkney and Shetland in a box and bringing it closer down to, the, to England, um, maybe it shortened the journey for this moth. But it was seen as a first for, for, for Scotland as a migrant um, in Orkney. Um, also in Orkney, coxcomb prominent. This was the first proof that coxcomb prominent was breeding in the islands. I think if any of us found coxcomb prominent as an adult or as a caterpillar, yes, we, we, we would be a little bit excited, but we probably wouldn't realise how significant it was But if we were on Orkney. So it just shows that species that uh, we see commonly um, in other parts of the country are very, very rare. So uh, this is now confirmed as a breeding species in Orkney. Another remarkable record was the black neck. Now, the black neck only occurs in Scotland, literally just over the border on the Berwickshire coast, and it's a long way south to the next nearest colonies. And I, I with others, have been to make the pilgrimage to look for black neck, at this site. But this year one occurred over on the west coast near Troon and this is a, a photograph of it and Roy Leverton says that this is more similar to this, the uh, black necks that occur on the west coast in Cumbria and Lancashire where it has been spreading and it seems that the pattern of spread is that you get the occasional individual moving 50 or 100 kilometers north and it seems to go act as a stepping stone and then slowly over the subsequent years there's a bit of backfilling as people then record it and then there's another jump so it seems that this stepping stone that the moth has perhaps jumped from Cumbria across Dumfries and Galloway to find itself in Troon so maybe over the next four or five years there'll be a bit of black back fill in and maybe the moth will uh, set up another stepping stone and continue to, to move north. Who knows? And Devon carpet is another species that is doing very, very, very well. It first colonised, uh, was found in Scotland, I think in 2013 in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, and you can see here from the map, there's a number of dots from, uh, from that area. 
But uh, there were three significant records of Devon carpet uh, in 2020. One, it was found in, uh, in Kintar in Westlock Tarbit, which is probably about here. There was another one in Ayrshire and a third one in the Trossachs. So another good year for this species and showing that it is still moving north. A chocolate tip is probably one of us, our rarest uh, moths. Um, it occurs at a single site in Deeside, or has since 2000, um, at Dinnit, where it's feeding on the Aspen. Uh, there are one or two older records where it's not been seen elsewhere in the Highlands. So we've always thought that it's only confined to this one particular wood where there's a, a large stand of mature aspens. It's always been a bit baffling as to why that's the case. But this year, um, it's been found further north at, uh, by Morag Coles at Torfins. So, uh, you know, a, a few miles or several miles further north than its, known, um, than its previously known site. So is it going to be resident there or is this just a stray? We don't know, but a very exciting find. Now, uh, Catty mentioned the uh, lures that you can use for emperor moth. Well, a lure has now been developed for lunar hornet moth. This moth, the, the larva, live within the living wood of sallows and possibly aspen. Um, they've been very, very difficult to, to find. You can go and look for the workings. Um, and record them that way and if you're lucky you might be able to find on a summer's day early in the morning a, a male or female lunar hornet having emerged and basking on the on the trunks of the willows but it's a bit of a game changer now that uh, these lures are available and that they're, they're working so readily um, I certainly know people in Fife have been recording it and, and finding lots of new sites for it but this is from, this is David Long from The Borders. And in his email that uh, Barry passed on, he said that last week I received a new pheromone lure for Luna Hornet, Hornet Clearwing and spent the last two days driving around places in the general area. So he went to Kyle's Hills, Dunn's Castle, Gordon Moss and others. So he was picking out sites where there was willows. He also spent the next day out on his bike um, cycling around but again no good. So he spent three almost solid days looking for this species. The uh, following day at home he put the lure out on a willow in his garden and lo and behold he caught one. So it just shows that there can be things uh, you know under, under the radar in your very back garden. And on the right hand side we have a peacock moth. Now, not particularly rare but this is from uh, VC99 Dunbartonshire uh, but it was new to the Vice County. But what is really nice is that John Clark, who recorded this during lockdown, he was just started to get into moths. He made his own moth trap, and this is the result, a new record for the VC. Other species that have done have, are new to the VCs. The older moth here was new to uh, West Invernessia. It was found uh, near a Haracle by Sandy McNeil, or Akarakal, as I've heard it pronounced before. And in VCs 95 and 96, which is Murray and uh, uh, East Invernessia, it's been the year of the footmen. All these three footmen are new to the Vice County. But what is more amazing, that all these three footmen were found close or within Nethy Bridge. So Nethy Bridge is obviously the village of the footmen. Moving to Sky, um, this almost comes from the Sky Mountain Rescue. Two old ladies were found on Sky. Obviously, they mean the moth. So this is new to the Vice County. Uh, old ladies have reached Sky, with a pair being seen. We'll now quickly move on to some of the micros. And this just shows you what you can do in lockdown. This is Nigel Voden, who lives in Fife, who always catches lots and lots of moths in his garden. Um, this year he's caught 400 species, 60 of which are new to his garden. He's only been living there for three years, but uh, within his, oh, sorry, I'll go back. But also he has found 27 species new to Fife and 21 of those are within the five miles of lockdown. So again, it just shows what you can find on your own patch if you look. So a remarkable achievement. And the two that are illustrated there are both new to Scotland. 
as is the species there, which I won't try and pronounce, that uh, Tim Brain recorded from Kinross, also in Fife. Paul Mappelback um, found this moth in the pot, uh, which again turns out to be uh, new to, to Scotland, uh, feeds on bird's foot trefoil, and this is a wonderful photo of the Addo by Tom Tams. So I'll go with the old name, Syncopacma synctella. So another exciting find. And Nick Cook catches lots and lots of moths and lots of small moths. And he actually takes the time and the patience and obviously uh, is very, very good at identifying all these tiny moths in the debris of the bottom of the trap. And all these species here are new to his vice county. Uh, and the one in the center, Biotropha basaltinella, is new to Scotland. So another very, very good find and just shows you the dedication of our wonderful volunteers. And now, on the right, we have Carutis diana. Uh, the common name is the Afric twitcher, a species that is only known from Glen Afric, nowhere else in Scotland. We've been trying to encourage people to record it. We found it in a new, a couple of new one kilometre squares by finding the caterpillar spinnings. But uh, it's very difficult to find the adults. Uh, they nectar on thistle and on ragwort. But Mike, when he was up there photographing this one that he found on the adjacent thistle, he found this, its very common cousin, Carutis pariana, the apple skeletonizer. But it was probably now that species in the Glen is far rarer than Diana, which is the, the, you know, the, the real priority species. So it just shows you how many people would have uh, gone up there and noticed this and just put it down as, a, as a excitingly or over excitingly as the Diana rather than a Pariana. So it just shows you how careful you have to be. And it now means that when I'm trying to encourage volunteers to get out to Glen and look for these as adults, that uh, yes, we've now really got to be careful and look for its very similar species. Now finally, I'm going to set you a little bit of homework. This is horse chestnut leaf miner. You can see from the map at the bottom that there are uh, records. The very first record from Scotland actually came from Perthshire. There's a record from Ayrshire. Uh, there's subsequently been a few in, in West Lothian and in Dumfries and Galloway. This was found just over the road from me here in the, in the borders in Melrose, uh, and it's the first record for the borders. Um, following that Find, finding Malcolm Lindsay has been out around Gala and found it in a couple of new places, as has Barry Prater in Berwickshire and found it in the last few weeks at a couple of new sites as well. So this moth is moving into Scotland. It's taken a little while for it to become established, but I think now it's certainly in the borders. It is here, here to stay. So go out and look at your conquer trees and look for the distincting feeding signs of the horse chestnut leaf miner. So thank you all for listening. Um, thank you for everybody who sent in all the, all the news and all the photographers. And yes, apologies to anybody that I should have acknowledged and I haven't acknowledged. Great, thanks Tom. That was a really good roundup. Uh, I don't have any questions as such, but there's a lot of people commenting in the chat box that uh, during the big butterfly count, there were species that they wanted to, to put down, which they weren't able to. So maybe we could look at, uh, look at that for next year. Uh, so we've come to the end of our program now, um, and despite a couple of technical hitches at the beginning, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I think it went quite well for our first ever attempt. Um, so we're running a bit over time, so I'm just going to quickly round up today's gathering. I'd like to extend a huge thanks to all of our speakers today who spoke on a really interesting range of topics. We've had a good balance of both butterflies and moths, and even caterpillars had their very own talk as well. Well done to Phil and Tom uh, for making sure that we could still have our hugely popular last night's moths at lunchtime. That was fantastic uh, and something we could maybe keep going as well. Uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Anthony for dealing with the technical side of things uh, behind the scenes and keeping all of us right. It was uh, very helpful. Thank you. Uh, and Shona as well, our office manager for her uh, organisation behind the scenes as well, sending out links to everybody, etc. 
Uh, today we've had several talks from our own BC staff members about their highlights and plans for the future. I think it's evident that um, despite these challenging times, uh, we are in a strong position to move forward with an excellent Scottish team and new enthusiasm. There are many exciting new projects um, and opportunities on the horizon to look forward to, and I hope that we'll get to see all of you again soon uh, in person, hopefully as a, uh, at one of our volunteering events. And thank you once again for joining us today.